anyone from the finance committee hearing seeing none communications hey um yeah so the communications committee has been meeting uh, for regularly for several months since the fall gathering and um, we have made some progress uh, in particular I would mention that we um, came up with a new uh, process for approving communications in a timely manner um, in together with the co-chairs and um, we have uh, basically road tested this for example, when um, we officially got our ballot set us back and then we were contacted by uh, several media outlets from WIST Politics, the New York Times, and, and then we were able to, um, you know, get a timely statement to them by a short deadline. Um, we've also put out statements on issues such as the new legislative maps, um, you know, in addition to our, our usual kind of communications about membership meetings, um, you know, and uh, seeking candidates and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so as usual, you know, we can we can always use more help um, as any of the committees can. So I'll just put a plug for all our committees if, uh, you know, if people are, are willing to help out doing the, the real work of the party, then, you know, please consider volunteering for a committee. Pass. Any questions for communications committee? I, I have a question. Um, how is the response looking in the, the, the direction of the responses? Is Can, can you share that information? Because I know everyone's looking at us and, and looking at us in the wrong way. We have an opportunity to address the pop up window, media issues. player window, playback controls, Excuse previous that. button. We have, we have um, an opportunity to address issues, but we don't want to address the wrong type of attention. So trying to promote um, projects, um, implementing inclusion opportunities, business opportunities, disability opportunities, homeless opportunities of that nature. Can you elaborate a little bit on the responses of this, the questions that they're, that they're, they're looking for? Um, sure. Yeah, I, you know, I would say that uh, right now in, in terms of the media, they are interested in the Green Party. They're looking at us. Um, most for most of them, they're kind of their first reaction is, how is the Green Party going to impact the other parties, uh, you know, in in the presidential election in other elections? Um so that that often is kind of where they're coming from, but that at least gives us an opportunity to get our message out and also to break down the narrative that, you know, having just two choices that are the same on most issues is any kind of democracy. Um, so, yeah, I would say that it's all, you know, there are always challenges with getting our message out, but I feel like we've been doing a really good job of that. And particularly in a state where we are, um, you know, very much under scrutiny um, and, you know, they're, they're looking to trip us up basically and frame us as part of their narrative. I feel like um, we have done an extremely good uh, job of, um, of getting our message out successfully. Um, you know, that said, I think we, we could do a lot more in terms of, putting out content on social media via email and things like that to, you know, to reach more people, communicate more with our supporters. So, you know, like I said, uh, the more people we have who can help us work, the better. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions for communications committee? Kingfisher stack. Go ahead. Um, I'm on communications committee uh, and I just wanted to um, 
note that Dave had spoken about from the perspective of being on Jill Stein's campaign, that this time around, Dave had said he felt a bit more respect from the media. There's some speculation maybe there was a longevity aspect that um, we're more of a recognizable brand across the generations now. Um, you uh, concur with that? And also, I'd want to say um, the caucuses are a really good um, focus point for specific uh, groups and specific uh, causes, interests. So um, there are a lot of different caucuses um, and uh, at the national and, uh, you know, we were specifically talking about getting youth caucuses going more past. Dave, you want to speak to that? Because there's something I want to speak to that also. Yeah, well, I can, re I'll respond to the part about communications. Um, and the short answer is yes, I do think that the lasting power of the Green Party has earned us a certain respect and has allowed us to build relationships. And, you know, the media saw how the Democrats conspired to keep us off the ballot in 2020. Um, but we came right back. And so I think it's and, you know, it's an interesting story for them. It it really it also burst the the narrative that the Democrats are somehow fighting to save democracy, you know, when they're constantly trying to remove their competition from the ballot. Um, yeah. And I think there, there is a certain fact that we've lasted, we're still going, uh, you know, we're, we're not going away. And, um, also, you know, we, we just have had time to build relationships with certain people in the media. Um, and yeah, so, so there's some respect there. Thanks for the question. Uh, pass. Yeah. And I also just want to echo what Dave said, um, with some of the, um, media that has reached out, um, to me and the, the line of questioning I found from them has been different than what the media has done in the past when I've done um, communication works um, within the Green Party. Um, prior to is always about, you know, the spoiler question as well as, you know, um, is the Green Party like serious enough and along those line of questionings and now it's more of questions I'm like so tell us more about the Green Party tell us about these issues how is it an alternative choice um they, they may ask the spoiler question maybe like maybe a couple of times but there is this sort of shift in the questioning at, at least in respects to Wisconsin um because I feel like some of the journalists here in, in the state um are really thinking about you know that now that we have ballot access and, you know, talking about candidates and the presidential campaigns that are coming up, um, giving it a little bit more seriousness than trying to uh, attack us more. Um, I mean, they're going to do, I mean, the media is going to do what they're going to do for sure. Um, don't get me wrong, but I think there's a whole different, um, uh, different approach that they're taking this time around, I feel. If there are no other questions for communications committee, um, platform and policy. Kingfisher Stack. Go ahead. We have not done many meetings, uh, platform and policy, and um, that we have talked about doing more meetings regularly however i uh, don't have anything more to report on that pass thank you any any questions King, for? king fisher stack i'm sorry i i am remiss there was a topic uh reparations uh chester and i and company have uh added reparations as an official agenda item for platform and policy to develop more okay that passed thank you any questions for policy and platform i have a questions about the reparations policy go ahead jamie jamie jasmine excuse me 
Thank you. When you say that you've added reparations to the platform, what does that look like? Are you working with marginalized voices? At, at the current moment, it looks like an agenda item to discuss in the future. That's where it's at. It's been added as an official agenda item, and we have to have the discussion on it. There's been some unofficial discussion outside the committee meeting. Uh, that's just a topic that is on the burn. Thank you. I guess my question is, when you guys are going to have this agenda conversation, as I look around this room, it isn't very diverse in this room specifically. The other room, there are more people. But I'm just curious, when you have that agenda topic, will it be an agenda topic where you invite people who are marginalized to participate in that conversation? I think the majority of the committee represents marginalized populations, Chester and I. Um, and the next time we meet, <laughs> we're trying to figure that one out. But yeah, in the next committee meeting, welcome. You, anybody's welcome to join. Um, but yeah, we'll work in a date for the next platform policy meeting and we'll advertise it via email. Pass. Uh, any other questions? Hearing and seeing non uh, IT. Sorry, um, the IT committee recently lost the majority of its members um, to our recent resignations. So I've been trying to get um, we're trying to reestablish the committee, um, get our feet under ourselves, and um, take care of getting our web website updates. Um, and that's about it. Um, if anyone's interested in interested in helping with the IT side of things, we could use additional support in that. Thank you. And I want to take this moment to uh, uh, applaud um, Emerson for doing uh, a lot of work um, this week to making sure, you know, Zoom links are getting out um, for this meeting and the special meeting we had last night as a coordinating um, committee. And so I just want to uh, give my applause to Emerson for that. Uh, any questions for Emerson? Hearing seeing none. Um, so our next item is about officer vacancies. Um, Hi, AJ, oh, should we should uh, have reports from the standing uh, the parties that exist right now? Um, the um, locals. Oh sure, I'm sorry. My my apologies. Um, anyone. Which local would like to speak first? Are you waiting for the Grand Milwaukee Green Party? Any, any, any local to speak up. So if Greater Milwaukee wants to give the report, go ahead. Hello, I'm Barbara Dobber and I'm co-chair of the Greater Milwaukee Green Party. Um, I was not aware that I would be giving a report right now, so I'll just do it off the top of my head uh, because I, I'm guessing our, um, our local uh, person is not here. Is he here? Sam? Sam? Okay, so um, what we've been doing, we have been uh, working with the uh, Power to the People campaign. We delivered, we helped them deliver um, 70 more pages, no, 700 more pages of signatures 
if that's correct, um, to City Hall, and that would be to help um, 7,000. 7, oh my goodness. Orders of magnitude greater than I just said <laughs> um, to uh, help Milwaukee get um, a, a municipal energy uh, that replaces we energies that's a monopoly. So that's uh, one mission that we've been part of, and we're really excited about that campaign. We have people who go out every week um, and, and do that petitioning. They asked us if uh, anybody wants to petition at noon on Sunday, starting at Val Milwaukee Church, and that's kind of the regular thing. Um, we uh, showed up at a county uh, meeting about a Palestine um, question. They, there was a, a county proposal written to support Palestine and and end the genocide there, and so we we. Uh, showed up and we spoke and we um, made recommendations about voting based on who in the county leadership voted um, against um, against the propo the original proposal which was peace in Palestine and um, there was a whole dynamic where they watered it down and they passed the watered down version and so we uh, we told people about uh, how that vote went in order to give them more information on that. Um, we also have somebody from the Poor People's Army, the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign with us. Um, so Nick, I don't know if you were able to come up and say a few words. Uh, I don't know if we missed introductions on that, but we, we definitely want to um, give Nick a, a minute of space because uh, he and, and uh, Galen came out all the way from Pennsylvania and did a 13 hour drive to come and meet us. So um, they're planning this march um, for, uh, they're marching on the RNC in Milwaukee and then they're gonna march 100 miles all the way to Chicago to march on the DNC. And so Greater Milwaukee Greens have been part of this effort and doing ambassadorship to help people get to where they need to go and meet who they need to meet and try and get everything together for that march. So um, did I miss anything or can I can I give Nick a minute? Yeah, those are amazing. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Barbara. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Nick Carmack. I use he and they pronouns. I bring you greetings from poor and homeless families from across the country. Um, I'm with the Poor People's Army, also known as the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. Um, some of you may be familiar with uh, one of our founders is Sherry Hunkla, who ran with Jill Stein in 2012 uh, for vice president. So every four years, we've been planning a march on opening day of both Republican and Democratic national conventions, wherever they're at. This is really weird that I'm like back to everyone in the room. But um, so. Uh, <laughs> It's, uh, I'm, I'm paying attention to you guys too. It, so yeah, every four years since 2000, we've been uh, planning marches of 10 to 20,000 people, um, and it's you know really, as poor people, all we have is our voice. That's the one thing that they can't take away from us. Um, and you know, we're a national organization. We're based in Philadelphia, but we got folks all across the country. Um, many of you that, that we know worked with in the past, uh, you know, a lot of people like yourselves who are doing good work in the community, important work, um, not all of us get to see it that are, you know, across the country and in different areas focused on different work. Um, so these, these marches for us uh, for the past 20 years or so have really been an opportunity uh, to shine a light on the, the work that people are doing in local areas and uh, you know bring people together um, who understand that these corporate parties are never gonna be a solution. They're the reason for the suffering. They stand in the way of justice. Uh, you know, as Greens, I know we all know this. Um, I love being in a room full of Greens. I'm, you know, of course, member of the Green Party of Philadelphia, uh, Pennsylvania delegate, but 
just being around other greens, you know, not, not people that I already know is just, it's always inspiring because, um, it's just this key thing that people haven't all waken up to yet is that, that we are our own leaders and that these leaders that are put before us by these corporate parties, um, they're evil and it, either way is the lesser of two evils. And so, um, you know, I know four, four years ago, there was a lot of people who didn't vote green, uh, greens, you know, all across the country. And, um, you know, I think that this March for us is an opportunity to talk about uh, some of what's happened in the in recent elections and how we as not just Greens, but a movement of independently minded people can come together, talk about where, where this movement's going, um, how we can all build relationships, um, because that's really, at the end of the day, the only thing that, that we have is, is our relationships. Uh, so we, you know, are looking for endorsements um, from Green Party chapters, any organizations I can share that with somebody um, that could, I'm sure, share it with all of you online. Um, and, you know, if there's any way of you endorsing or sharing it with other organizations uh, here in the area that you know would be interested, we, we would really appreciate that. Um, we, you know, are looking for folks to, to get involved in any ways uh, that that y'all can. And so again, um, Rita can can pass along my uh, contact information if you're you know interested in getting along and have any questions or, or whatever. But I don't want to take too much time. If anyone has questions, I can answer them. But okay. thanks, y'all. Thank you for sharing. Are there any other announcements from the Greater Milwaukee Green Party? Uh, AJ, I don't know if you want to talk about um, the get the let out. Yeah, so with Get the Let Out, uh, I think for many who may know, um, lead exposure in Milwaukee has um, been prevalent for, for many, many, many years. Um, particularly, there's a particularly with an ordinance um, that is set that lead laterals the the pipes that come from the main pipes that go into the homes um, is where most people get the lead exposure through the water. And so we have been meeting with people in Common Council. We've been meeting with Public Health Department. We've been sitting down with uh, various um, officials who are taking the, the coalition seriously. Um, we are also in the middle of trying to produce um, a documentary um, that's going to be solely for social media. And hopefully once we get that out there and put out there, hopefully with some sort of screening of some sort. Um, so we, we, it's, it's been relatively, we've been relatively active um, between meetings and, you know, hopefully getting, you know, the local institutions to pay attention and hopefully making the necessary um, changes that need to happen coming from, you know, through grassroots coalition work. If there's no one else, anything else with Greater Milwaukee, um, Four Lakes, do you have something? You know, um, we didn't really plan a report because it wasn't on the agenda, but can uh, just say a few quick words on, you know, some of our uh, local priorities that um, we've decided to focus our work on. Uh, so one is the housing crisis. Um, you know, there's a huge affordability crisis, uh, spike in evictions, just, uh, you know, some of the highest rent increases in the country. Um, and, you know, particularly in Madison, there's kind of a lot of uh, political fights over housing supply issues, um, you know, and also th things that are related, such as access to transportation. Um so that ties in with another one of the issues that we're prioritizing, which is 
access to public transit, biking and walking, you know, not just remaining in a car centric development um, mindset and also, you know, the importance of transportation alternatives for sustainability and climate. Um, and as we're looking at budget deficits and kind of a, you know, a narrative of austerity, we want to avoid, uh, you know, we want to prevent them sacrificing uh, our needed climate goals and overall sustainability goals to, um, you know, to budget deficit uh, concerns. Um, yeah, and just um, another issue related to environmental concerns is water quality. Um, there have been, in particular in areas of Dane County, PFAS spikes um, with the F-35s at Truex Field. That's an additional source of contamination. Um, and also just pollution of our lakes and, and water supplies with agricultural runoff um, and, and other chemicals. Um, yeah, so um, that's just kind of like a brief summary of the issues that were, that were some of the issues that we're currently focused on pass. If I may, I'd like to integrate or integrate um, the poor peoples. Please, if you can get a hold of me, send me an email at the jz at votejz.org. I'd like to push this into Congress. We got to get a, a committee into the House for the poor peoples to get some attention. The Democrats and everybody's going to want to utilize this also. There's a great opportunity, and then utilizing the press in the right way. The water problem that's going on, please, again, get a hold of me. There's a beautiful new technology in this water, it's cheap and expensive, and it's a, just some understanding and education that can be easily implemented to help correcting this water issue. So I'm working on this like, intensively, but um, we got to connect more. Um, let, me, let me help in these issues as much as I can to bring it forth into Congress so we can get the proper attention um, to make this develop. We have the right initiative and motive, but we need the dynamics involved now. Uh, Kingfisher, you have something? Um, I just had a question uh, for the um, the Poor People's Army. Um, one of the things I um, have been uh, seeking out for several years is how does the uh, vernacular, how does the um, way of talking about social action in an army, m metaphorical army, or maybe it's a literal army. I don't know, but one of our pillars is peaceful, passive, we're pacifists, we're nonviolent. So how, how does militarism lingo fit into our policy platform? Uh, are, are we the soldiers of love? Are we um, yeah, warriors in the heart? Rainbow warriors? What? What? How does the conversation go to merge yeah. pacifism with militarism? Pass. Uh, that's a good question. We're definitely a nonviolent army. Um, some of some folks may know the organization, the Poor People's Campaign. Um, we are the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign. We created the AKA Poor People's Army to distinctify that we are not. The Poor People's Campaign, which was started by our former intern, um, which is another conversation in itself. Uh, but, you know, there's been a war waged on poor people. There's no two ways about it. Um, this has been happening for, for hundreds of years. Um, and so we intend on, on being as serious as they are. And so that's why we use the name Army, really. It's not a we're not violent. We, we, we're really about unity, bringing people together from all across the country. Um, you know, not just through this march, but going forward, we, we just got to build these relationships and, and show people that there is an enemy. Um, and the, the army kind of gets people to start asking those questions. But thank you. And, and also, Jorge, I'll definitely be, uh, you know, sending you an email, reaching out. We'll, we'll talk. So if any other questions, definitely um, let me know. Uh, Kingfisher, 
I, 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 I put I put the comment in there, but yeah, uh, they only call it class war if you dare fight back. Uh, yep, I guess uh, different tactics of fighting back are not with uh, violence. So, as I said earlier, um, at this meeting, that we, we have a very tight schedule, and I'm glad that we are um, expressing some of the things that we're doing um, with our and, our and our locals and everything. Um, we we do need to move forward. Um, um, especially when we have candidates um, you're going to be talking here at one o'clock. So with that said, um, with our other agenda item on officer vacancies, um, again, just to reiterate, um, we've had two people um, resign from their respective positions um, in the state party. Uh, last night, um, the coordinating council, excuse me, the coordinating committee uh, held a, a special meeting to go over like the, the draft of this agenda for today's meeting, as well as addressing the off officer vacancies. And uh, per to the bylaws, um, made um, some appointments, some people stepped up. Um, and as you can see on the agenda, um, both Emerson and Bobby have um express interest of being co-chair and treasurer um, respectively. Uh, that vote was held also last night and um, presenting it to the, to the membership um, of these two individuals who are willing to uh, do the work that needs to get done um, in our state party. Um, so if there's anything that Emerson wants to say or Bobby would like to say, I'm, I'm going to open the floor to you. Um, and then from there, see our candidate endorsements. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, regarding the uh, Poor People's Campaign, um, I had been working uh, somewhat, not real tightly with uh, uh, Brittany Reamer and Bruce Grau, who are the Poor People's Campaign coordinators in Wausau in North Central Wisconsin. Now, uh, Bruce has kind of stepped away, but um, Brittany Reamer has now taken the role of, um, she's the state, I don't know, director or coordinator for 350 org. And at the same time, she's still wearing a poor people's campaign hat. So it was a real interesting uh, on-campus meeting with the campus chapter of 350 uh, in which she brought in, it was interesting seeing a 350 meeting with the whole screen taken up with poor people's campaign and poor people's issues. And that same weekend, uh, a crew from the campus went down to Madison uh, there was some sort of a, a manifestation at the Capitol, I forget what it was called, but it had to do with poor people's campaign and poor people's issues. So I think that the wisdom of, um, they really sold me on the wisdom of uh, linking the war on carbon <laughs> right, with the war on poverty in a figurative way. And uh, we don't have to call ourselves an army, but um, we can use lingo like that, I suppose. But yeah, just to link the issues that, um, as the campus kids point out, it's always the poorest communities, and I'm thinking in Wisconsin, the, the uh, indigenous people, right, in the Anishinaabe up north, uh, who suffer from the negative impacts of the carbon economy. And I'm thinking of line three, I'm thinking of line five, the whole uh, corridor of pipelines that run through the Ho-Chunk territory to the west of us. Uh, these are all like, like a neo-colonial um, land occupation by, uh, you know, the, the biggest uh, imperialist corporations in the USA. And Enbridge Pipeline is certainly one of those. So those are a few insights that I have um, about that, and I'll show up. <laughs> uh, thank you. 
Thank you, Bobby. Okay. Um, Emerson? Three Migs. Hi. So uh, thanks, everyone, for sharing about the Poor People's Campaign. Um, I know in our agenda, we have room for open discussion after we talk candidate endorsement. Um, I would love to set up some breakup out rooms so we can have some of those conversations and some of the conversations that we're having in chat um, as well. Um, and we'll get that going uh, after candidates have their chance to present. Um, my name is Emerson. Um, I use they, them pronouns. Um, I'm currently living up in Superior, Wisconsin. And this last week, I've just really, I don't know, I've stepped forward in a lot of ways to help keep the coordinating committee running, um, following some resignations, and have had several people reach out to me telling me I should uh, step into the role of um, co-chair. Um, and a little bit about my background is um, went to school for gender studies um, and then um, worked politics a little bit the last couple of years, um, worked for some Democrats a Democratic candidate up in uh, Northern Wisconsin, who I feel like had a lot of green values, um, and then ran for office um, for city council as an independent, um, and have been trying to find a place where my values fit, and the Green Party is it, has been for a long time, um, and I'm excited to help us move forward, help us focus on action, help us focus on getting people elected and build up the infrastructure to do so and to support voices around our state. I'm I'm in Superior, Wisconsin, Bobby. Um, pass. Thank you. Um, any questions for Emerson or Bobby? Um, Rita staff. I just wanted to find out uh, what Bobby's uh, background is in um, uh, working as a treasurer of an organization. Yeah, I can I can speak to that. I um I don't, I don't recall exactly what years it was, but um, I was treasurer of the Wisconsin Greens for. I want to say maybe three years. I don't know. David can correct me if I'm wrong here. Um, so that's uh, that was my treasury experience uh, relevant to um, this position. Any other questions for Bobby or Emerson? Stack. James, go ahead. Hi, I know we don't have much time for the candidate endorsements, but um, can you hear me here? Yes. Okay. I just wanted to um, ask of Emerson and um, Bobby. I mean, we have a sort of divide within the party, and obviously, you know, Sam and Melissa's resignations are um, indicative of that. I just wondered if Bobby and uh, Emerson, either now or later, or both could speak to whether they see themselves as people who can heal that divide and find common ground, or whether they see themselves as someone who is sort of devoted to a particular side of this uh, divide that we find ourselves in. Pass. Um, yeah, I can go ahead. Can I? May I? Go ahead. All right, I'll go ahead. Um, in terms of working with, um, you know, I would say a polarity or a divide, a duality in an organization, I do have um, my past six years experience serving on uh, Portage County Board, which has until this spring's election has been very uh, Republican dominated. And by that, I mean dominated by the um, 
sort of a growth paradigm, um, giant agribusiness in charge of the environment rather than um, environmentalists in charge of the environment, which is ironic given that UWSP here is probably the premier campus for learning environmental issues statewide or even in the Midwest. So I've had to learn how to, um, you know, speak at meetings and get my point across. And here's one of the things I say all the time, and I, I'm not sure everybody gets it in the county meetings, but um, you can't govern with ideology, right? What you have to govern with is facts, data, evidence. In other words, you, you have to use the scientific method in governance. And so that would be, I wouldn't come into this with an ideological slant, I would say, but rather, you know, we have a wealth of uh, environmental and social justice uh, literature and learning you know, behind us. We just have to be able to apply it uh, to benefit our people. The main thing to remember is to benefit our people. Uh, to James's question, I don't have a like particularly strong feeling on any bit of the uh, recent debates there. Um, I came in after the majority of the conflict had occurred um, and had not been an active member of the party before that conflict or during that conflict at its height. Um, and I am happy to work with people who have been on both sides of that conflict um, and would like to move on from it. Um, if there's anything that still needs to be addressed, I have some experience in um, restorative justice um, based um, commun and community focused restoration practices. Um, not a whole lot, but would also be willing to bring in outside parties who could help us resolve if there's continuing tensions that need resolution. Um, mostly my focus would be on helping us find ways that we can be active going forward and move towards the goals of our party. Thanks. Thank you to you both. So Kingfisher, I see that you're on stack. Um, we do have a couple of minutes before we start our next item. So if it's a very brief question. Um, a brief question to Emerson. Um, you're certainly well familiar with the ally concept. Um, and we're situated in a particularly indigenous part of the world active here with the line five issue. Um, I'm just also curious, um, Bobby, who are your people? Are you native? Oh. oh, can I speak? <laughs> Who are my people? Well, I always tell people, uh, uh, I come from the, uh, I come from the original colonizer nation, and British on both sides, or English on both sides, both the New England and uh, island of Bermuda, where my mom came from, which is still a British colony to this day. So I guess I could say I have come at things uh, with an anti-colonialist uh, colonizer background. How does that sound? <laughs> okay, cool, cool. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, with all the news of Haiti in the world, I, I mean, language is very important. And I looked up how Haiti people say their place in the world, and they say, I eat Aidi and the Americans hate it. I just, you know, I don't know why the language works that way. But anyway, um, uh, strong, strong pride there. And Emerson, could you say one word on the ally relationship and role past? Um, so I think a lot of people think of ally as a like identity or title. Um, I don't think that's 
true. Um, to be an ally is more of a verb, and it's all through action and words. Um, and if your words and actions are not living up to that, um, I don't know. I, I don't think it's right to, for someone to call themselves an ally. I think that it's um, the right of a community to say, this person's an ally of ours. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Yes. It, it, we are a little past one o'clock. Um, and we do have candidates. So who... I um, sorry to jump in, but um, I know that Jill Stein was planning to call in at one, but um, she needs a dial-in number, and I'm not sure that we shared the dial-in number, um, only the link. She is currently traveling by car, and so she needs um, an actual number to dial into. So I am grabbing it right now and sending it to. Her. Okay, great, thank you. So with our um, candidate um, presentations, um, we have Joe Nathan, Kingfisher. Um, hopefully Cheshire comes on and talks about his campaign. And then we'll get into the presidential campaigns. Um, I, th I think actually, um, so yesterday we had discussed um, going to presidential campaigns right at one because okay, yes, 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 yes. Um, Emerson had actually arranged specific times with the presidential candidates. Um, and yeah, so I, I think we had arranged with uh, Jill Stein at 1 p.m. And like I said, she's just trying to call in now. Um, and yeah, so we want to we want to stick to that because our presidential candidates may not be able to stay longer than that time frame that we arrange with them. What time did you arrange with the Sherman campaign? Because I thought I was speaking at one. Um, Emerson could answer that question. I believe question, I had just yeah. given a one o'clock, one o'clock to two o'clock. For all of us, correct. For 20 minutes each. Um, I, yeah, sorry. Okay, sorry, I was confused about that. As so, Jorge is here, if he wanted to go first, I could defer my time or split it with him. So, Jorge, if, if you're good with that, um, if you want to speak for a moment and then Jasmine and then whatever Jill gets on, we'll go from there. Yeah, I would like to speak, but I want to know why I'm here. I want answers. I want to know what's going on with this committee in the state. What is your goal? You're talking about inclusion. Where the you want to help? Leadership, movement, action. I want those petitions signed on my website. I want to get some goals here. Are we favoring Stein? I want a clear answer. Are we utilizing the news the way we're supposed to be doing it? I'm for the people. I'm poor myself and I'm disabled. And I work my ass off every day to help these people. I want to blow away all this ideology stuff. And the poor people's army is a defense for the constitution. It keeps people don't like army. You have to defend yourself. If you're not going to become a victim, it's the people's voice, but they need to in, in, create intelligence, sign the petitions, use the legal system that we have work together and pool. Again, I want to know why I'm here. I want to know why my actions aren't being heard or listened to. Where's the participation? Actions speak louder than words. Don't tell me you love me. I want you to show me. If you want to change the direction, do it. Don't just say it. I don't want all this confusion and anger. Why did these people leave? What's really going on here? You know, what's splitting? We're beating around the bush. The people want answers. You're hurting the people if we're not organized and we're not moving in the same direction. 
You need to work together. We need to have proper inclusion. Everybody participates. But if I don't see no numbers rising, there's nothing to address. We, we got to move and act together as one. If with the poor people, with the problems with the waters, and all this delegation that needs to be set forth, sign the petitions, take it in front of Congress, make the committees force them to action, utilize the press in the right way. Don't answer their questions. Utilize that moment to address the concerns of the people. Let's fight for the people their way. I'm there for you. I'm a people's president. I work every day. I sweat every day and I cry every day and I pray every day. I want you to take this into your hearts. Let's work together. Ask me some questions that I can help out and make a positive change in this planet. This, this make the Green Party strength, is strengthen it, make it blossom, bear the fruit, let everyone eat it, let it know it's good, and just do it again. We got to plant seeds across America, but we're not going to start. I don't know what's really going on here. It's a, we, we got to make a direct mo motive of action here. You know, from the Marine Corps, everybody's crying and bickering, but through pressure and intensity, they don't know a person what they're capable of. I'm pushing you and I'm pressuring you right now. Everybody that's listening to me, if we want to work together, we got to have this goal. It's not going to be easy, but we got to get up that heel. People are going to fall, grab them, pull them up together. So I'm, this is what I'm telling you right now. I'm being very serious and I'm being real because I don't see this action playing in the right way. Are we all working together here? Can someone answer me? Yes, yes. Amen. That's a good yes. I just want to know that I want to work. I'm fighting for you. And no matter what it is, or where I'm at, or what position I'm in, it's the internal goal. You know what I mean? All the bittering and stuff, people, it's going to happen. It's natural. But you're talking to a Marine and a world champion. I know what it is to get there and how to make it happen. So let's just let's keep moving together. I love Jasmine. And her, all her challenges that she's overcome and all through all the states, let's embrace that. Let's embrace everybody's strengths so we can keep moving together. It is a march. It is an army. We are in defense. Let's fight for the people. Work together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank really you, good Jesus. words. Thank you, Jorge. Thank you. Uh, Jasmine. Hold up. Um, so we we offered Jorge 20 minutes. If he wants to oh. take questions, he's welcome to as well. Um, and then Jasmine's got 20 minutes after that, and then Jill will be calling in after that. How does that sound for going forward? That's fine. Is that agreeable to everyone? That sounds good. Perfect. Thanks. So go ahead and lay them on me. Give me some good questions. Yeah, hello. Um, oh, I see Rita is ahead of me, maybe. Yeah. Well, speaking of to Jorge, you know, I um. I'm just coming back into this, so I'm not familiar with your, um, I should be, but I'm not familiar with your um, campaign and, and, you know, wh why you're addressing, well, the questions that you're addressing to the group here. So uh, real briefly, what what are you running for and uh, could you just name your website, maybe? Yes, thank you. I'm running for, I'm a president, I'm a recognized presidential candidate for representing the Green Party. <sighs> Number one, the website is votejz.org. The email address is jz at votejz.org. I want you to know that I started from nothing, but sheer belief and strength. Intensity of knowing without seeing, projecting and manifesting your destiny. <clears throat> My job is to create belief in your heart and to enlighten the people again, because everybody's in fear right now. Everybody's scared. 
to speak up, to reach out, to receive. It's, it's be, we're putting cages around ourselves, reflecting our small egos and our perceptions of what we think we know and using these emotional states to guide us. It's wrong. We need to set a goal. We need to reinitiate your heart inside. We need to make it pump with love and, and not this fear. It, without this belief, we're going to have confusion and we're going to have loss of direction. So my job is to strengthen the American people's belief in their heart. I, heard, I just saw a question from Marine to Green. <clears throat> I made several attempts in my life and for the participate in the Marine Corps. My MOS is MEOPS. I'm a musician. And um, I still play to this day. My very short time in the Marine Corps was struck down because of my vision. They, they saw inside my retinas. They weren't, um, it was a risk. So my career was, it was taken shortened within um, boot camp. Only like 40 something days of training. So it was, it was a hard, but when I was in there, I loved it. It was beautiful. It was intense. It was silent. The calmness, the intensity of knowing. There's nothing that could have happened to stop these people from getting reaching their goals. What they did was excel their spirits. They pulled it out of their body and they pulled it in front of them. They broke the threshold of the flesh and they went to the spirit. And this was makes the Marine Corps very powerful. And also, they defend this country. They defend you. They grab you and they'll lift you up. You got to respect the people who brought us here and was carrying us. Also, from being a world champion Blue Devil, like I, like I said, I still play to this day. And I'll be more than happy to play for someone right now at the drop of a hat. It's um, the spirit. It's what's great inside. Do you have a soul? Where did it come from and where is it going to go? You got to question yourself. It's the people. It's your vote, your right. Where is it going to be placed and how are we going to get there? So I'm telling you, get rid of the fear. It's always going to be there, the unknown, the darkness. But you just must see the light in front of it. But thank you. Rita and the Greater Milwaukee Greens. Yeah. I see on your website that you have a bunch of petitions, and that's what uh, you must have been talking about in your, in your uh, talk. I'm wondering, are you asking people to download them and then pass them around and then send them to you? What is, what is your idea with the petitions? No, the petitions, they're already, what you go ahead and do online is that you're going to fill out the petitions. You're going to sign in online. You put your name, um, your signature is there. So that gets document, goes into Google Drive, goes into the docs. It's an, it's an actual petition with your name. And then you get an email showing that you signed a petition. So there's an exchange. There's no fees on it. It's just the way the system has developed. So you go in, you sign your petitions, fill it out. You get a receipt. I have data that I can take forth in front of Congress and fight for you. But I need the petitions. You have to work together. And so that's, that's what I'm talking about. Thank you very much for looking. I really appreciate that. Kingfisher? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, hey, Jorge. Um, thank you so much for uh, your dedication and uh, inspiration and time and expertise. Um, I, I'm real uh, curious on two topics. Uh, Christian nationalism in the United States military. And also, um, you're talking about some pretty relative cultural concepts here in northern Wisconsin. It's actually one of um, the origin places of a very modern concept of two spirited. And um, that that's in Wikipedia. There's a great brief history of two-spirited concept, which is very new concept, a few decades old. I was graduated high school before that was coined as a phrase. Now, however, in traditional Ojibwe, uh, I'm first language Ojibwe speaker, grew up with it, 
we never converted to Christianity. And I can tell you that it doesn't matter whether a person has one spirit, two spirit, three spirit, four spirit, or more. Uh, it has nothing to do in traditional Ojibwe with gender or sexuality, and anybody can have that many. So um, uh, there's a great history on Wikipedia about multiplicity in identity and multiplicity in ontology, existence, what exists. So um, uh, just more to the point, would you say something about Christian nationalism in the U.S. military as a domestic threat? past the spirit a belief intensity of knowing without seeing this is what drives people forward to this allude this the constitution is based on the natural law divine providence the natural creator this is the bible set forth these 10 commandments don't steal don't kill don't bear false witness these teachings are good this is what their basis of ethics are the pivoting point now if you don't have a soul, you don't believe you have one, that's your choice, your belief. But most people understand that we do have a soul, that it means something, that we have some type of destiny on this earth, what we do, how we share and we relate to others. This presence of knowing who you are helps drive you forward. A belief in something good and positive. The teachings of Jesus Christ are they bad to forgive, to understand, to accept, to receive, to acknowledge, to love thy neighbor as thyself? These are good beliefs. Now these beliefs, they're not accepted by all. And that's fine. We all have our own free will. And we have our own time and our own destiny and our own path. We have our own crucible that we have to go through in life. But hopefully we're able to meet each other on a common ground and be objective. But this belief and intensity of knowing without seeing is the most beautiful thing on this planet. This was created almost every beautiful aspect of reality that we have to enjoy now. So upholding your, what you have inside and knowing is it good or is it bad. We understand evil from good, don't we? This pivoting point, where does it come from? Where does this love in your heart come from? Think about it. So the teachings are good. If you don't like them, don't argue with me. You argue with him and see what he tells you. So I'm very intense of knowing that my success is all based on my belief and knowing in him. So I'm good testimony in the presence of Jesus Christ. And I say these things in his name, amen. James and then Kingfisher again. Hi, thank you, Jorge. Uh, uh, I, I wanted to know um, just kind of a similar question to what I asked um, Emerson and Bobby earlier. How, how would you as a presidential um, candidate for the Green Party work toward um, resolution of some of these uh, ideological divides within the Green Party, because you asked what's going on here and there are other people, everyone has their own opinion, but my opinion is that we have uh, great disagreements uh, within uh, even this room. Very good. And, and, and there's, uh, and there's, uh, just um, ways in which there are certain issues that uh, people who uh, I tend to talk more to uh, are trying to get those issues more oxygen in the Green Party. And there's other people who, you know, Sam and Melissa, for example, who uh, think that we're going about it in the wrong way or think that these issues are kind of cut and dried and not consistent with green values. So, uh, my my two cents is that when someone comes to the Green Party, they often have some of these heterodox views because they've already rejected the two party duopoly, or they're thinking about rejecting the two two party duopoly. So, a, my personal hope is that whoever our candidate is, whether it's Jill Stein or you or Jasmine, is th that they have a way of resolving these differences and and bringing together. 
um, people who may differ greatly, but but bringing all their energies to bear uh, on on a common problem. So through your experience in the military or other experiences, can you talk about how you might uh, bridge those divides and use the energies of of all uh, um, without in, you know engaging in what some of us would say would be cancel culture? Thank you. That's a beautiful question. How do we do this when we're all divided and split? We have different perceptions and our goals. First of all, we have to have the same goal. Number one, what is our goal and how are we going to get there, right? So everyone's picking across the way. Now, accepting everyone's differences is good. <clears throat> they all have a beautiful part to play. Not receiving them is bad. But we must be objective. There's three truths in this world. You're, and we have to separate this. This is where the problem begins or the, uh, the hope begins here the understanding here three truths your personal beliefs that you hold and love dear towards you there's political truths that we must acknowledge and understand and respect correct they're different then we have objective data the data can we convert that into objective truth but when we do don't bring it close to us Keep it away so we can look at it and make good sound decisions. We must be objective so we can have a proper understanding and development. Everybody's throwing things in, we can lay it down. Can we see it? Where's this information pointing? Is it going towards a goal? So laying our differences down is good. Being objective about the data needs to be and then we can convert that into some kind of truth but it must point in the same direction so as a businessman it's always projection where you've been where you're at and where you're going to go is it possible we're going to have to take a big jump a risk it's going to have to happen also to make positive changes we have to how are we going to cross that river so we're going to have to all work together to get there aren't we? we're going to, have to create a bridge so unifying our differences and accepting our differences is that's what a green is. We're all different perspectives. We all have our own times and our place and our moments, but we have to have the same goal. So this is again the three truths. Rotate these three truths. Separate your truth. Separate the political truths and look at the data. And then let me see. There's another part of this question that you. Um, Am I missing a point here? Did I cover that? There are two I think so. Did you get it? Yeah, I mean, just how do you bridge the gaps? And um, I think, um, would you, you know, have people who are sort of, uh, would be the metaphorical or the actual bridge between the two sides and, and have sort of conflict mediation and things like that? Is that, or, um, um, how would you sort of honor both sides and the work they bring to the table? Understanding and accepting and appreciating is very important. We have to have this understanding. When we don't, we cross our lines of our principles, don't we? This ethics, this pivoting point, we, we have to embrace, and we have to learn these principles, and we have to recite these principles every day. Because for humans, we're going to break them but can we reflect on it? And can we change ourselves? You know, can we accept humiliation? Can we say, I'm sorry, what I was saying was wrong. What I meant was this, are we taking things out of context to suit ourselves and our egos? You know, this is why people are splitting apart because they're not being understood. They're not being accepted, you know? And then, it, so it makes a person fight. When you don't give a value to somebody, what do you think is going to happen? You can bring, you're developing contention and anger and they're going to come at you. Or you broke their heart or they're going to go kill themselves. America's, what direction is America, America going? And you see it. You know, the people that are homeless and poor, their heart has been stepped on. Their value has been mistreated. We're not in democracy. I must let you understand this. This is not a democratic society. 
We have liberty, but there is no freedom. You're in, let me explain something to you. It was taught to me by a federal judge that got Clinton off. <clears throat> You're an undocked vessel trespassing in a harbor. If you open your mouth without being doctored, you're babbling and you're creating perjury against yourself. The only way to be docked is with an attorney and you must pay the toll. This is the society that we live in. We must be realistic of what we are. To make this change in difference, we need more attorneys. We need more intelligence. We need to sign the petitions. We need to throw our lines and pull and throw more lines and pull from different directions. We have to utilize what the structure is now and, and, and make, create more intelligence. Uh, we need more attorneys. Technology is advancing now. Let's use the AI lawyer. It's hooked up to the um, law libraries. This can help people that don't have this education and breach the gap so their voice can be heard. So you must accept what I'm saying is true because this is the land that we live in. And this is why everyone is confused. Why don't you have a value? And who's gonna represent you? And who knows how to make this difference? So this is where we are. We have to accept that. We don't like it. Well, now we have a voice and an opportunity to make this change. We have a pivoting crossroads right now. All these different directions. We must stay close together and move together. So again, thank you. I hope I answered that question. Jorge, thank you for your time. Um, it is yes, time for us you. to move on to our next presenter. Our thank, you. thank you. We really appreciate it. Mm -hmm. um, and we'll pass the floor to Jasmine and her campaign. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Jasmine Sherman. I do use they, them pronouns, not she, her pronouns uh, for future when people are going to discuss me. My platform is basic. We live in a country that is going through a collapse. It is time to provide for everyone's basic human needs. We have to stop being a country that puts profits over people and be a nation that puts people over profit. Um, what I propose is guaranteed housing, universal health care, free education, universal basic income. And uh, I also propose that we have term limits and age caps. Our country no longer serves us. We pay enough in tax money that grows abroad and doesn't take care of the basic things that we need in the United States of America, like education and infrastructure. What I have been fortunate to do is to travel this country and meet people. One of the issues that we are having, though, with bringing new people to the Green parties, I'm not sure that that's going to be an issue in Wisconsin, but in other states, we tell people to sign up for the Green parties, and there are administrative issues with bringing new people on board. If we want to grow the Green Party, we must work as a unit and make sure that we are helping people um, join the party. Uh, one of the things that we plan to do or we have been successfully doing is making sure that younger people participate in this process. Recently, because of younger people, 100,000 people voted for me to attend the free and equal debate, which I won. Um, that was voted again by young people uh, to make so we know that young people are all about third party candidates. We know that younger people want to put marginalized voices at the forefront. And I'm here to make sure that we as Green Party members do that, which is why I ask you questions about reparations and things like that. Younger people are tired of a lack of authenticity in politics. And so if we are going to say that we are different, I am hoping to continue leading the charge on demonstrating just how different we are. For example, taking a Zoom call from a, fo from a phone in a car when you're traveling across the country. It's very simple to use technology today and people want leaders that can use technology. I'm open to any questions. My platform is available at jasminesherman.com. Um, so if you have questions, I would be happy to answer them. Kingfisher Stack? Um, Jasmine, what is your top priority? What would what if you could accomplish one goal 
Like what would be guaranteed weird? housing? There is no reason in the country that's rich as ours that we have houseless people. There's no reason that candidates are not talking about housing people, especially as we could do it by giving indigenous people all of their land back, eliminating property tax, and making sure every American had access to housing. Also, that's my old website. I'm sorry. Here you go. The way we pay for guaranteed housing is actually a lot more affordable than the way we currently do housing. Uh, my platform spells it out to you. If you are unable to read it yourself, the platform will read it to you. But housing, healthcare, and education are my non-negotiables. It is what young people want. Um, and so we plan to give that to them when elected. Um, more to that point, I know that I've been told that in the 70s, there was an intentional push in the housing ownership field to um, basically get rid of cheap rent, that um, there was too many people with free time. There was, and I have historic records of this discussion. So um, in terms of property ownership, land ownership, have you thought in that realm at all, Pat? I am giving the land back to the indigenous community. If you would like to read my land back policy, you can contact us via jasminesherman.com or you could speak to my vice president uh, candidate, Tanda Blue Bear. But this land is stolen. So trying to preserve stolen land for the benefit of white supremacy does not serve our population. It is part of the reason we are living in a collapse. So when it comes to consulting people, we started in 2021 working on me running for president. We have consulted a number of experts, historians and legal officials. So I'm not currently consulting people. I'm running for president. Did that answer your question? Perfect. Uh, I see there's a question, Rita. Okay, this is coming from two people at the Greater Milwaukee uh, Green Party Hub here. Um, uh, what is your stance on the war in Ukraine and uh, the genocide happening in Gaza? My, so those are two different issues. The first issue with the war on Ukraine and the issue in Gaza is that American money no longer needs to fund war. We need to stop sending our taxpayer dollars to kill brown people. And we also need to stop spreading imperialism. My foreign policy, for anybody that's curious, is already posted. And there's an audio book if you wanted to read it. When it comes to any aid that we would be sending countries, we'll be providing them with medical supplies, clothing, food. We will no longer be providing them with weapons or selling weapons or being arms dealers. When it comes to the people in Gaza, we will end the occupation. Uh, we will no longer be funding Israel. And when I say end the occupation, that includes Hawaii. We need to give them their land back, Puerto Rico and Guam. Okay, I didn't hear. Um, so what would you do about um, Gaza? Stop funding Israel. Okay. Um, there was another question here. Of, what is your stance on medical freedom? So I don't just support medical freedom. I support universal health care. My policy is listed. I also support people having access to whatever they want to do with their body, including individuals that want death with dignity. And all of the policies that you hear me talk about today, there is a written counterpart on my website with an audiobook version that will read it to you if you don't have time. Thank you. Sean? Hello, thank you for being here. What is your, uh, what, are your, what are your thoughts or your program on labor and unions? So I actually just posted a video of this yesterday. What I propose is that when I'm elected, I'm going to be locking the country down for COVID for six weeks. That is a time where labor unions and employers should really negotiate. And should, at the end of six weeks, they have not reached an agreement, people would have guaranteed housing. They would have universal health care. They would have universal basic income. That would be the time for unions to really strike and do a general strike to get equitable conditions in the workplace. Does that answer your question? Because people right now don't strike because they're worried about not having their, their housing, their health care, their kids' education. But if we provide people with an opportunity to be comfortable while they are negotiating with employers, we would have a better option for negotiations. Michael. Michael, you are on mute, sir. I had... I, I had to unmute, yeah. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I'm a little bit confused. You said the first thing you would do was lock the country down for six weeks for COVID. No, I said uh, the first you, thing I would, 
I didn't say that. The first thing I said I would do was guaranteed housing. What I would be doing at my 92nd day, if COVID is still a problem, is locking the country down for six weeks. We have people who are immunocompromised. We have people who are disabled. We have people who have been negatively impacted by COVID. And because we have never put forth an actual plan to minimize the situation, we have to lock down and reset. And so what I would be using uh, I would be doing, I wouldn't start till the 92nd day that I'm in office because then everyone will have housing. So everyone will have a place. We wouldn't have houseless people. We would be utilizing National Guard and military people to deliver food and things like that as I would be recalling all of our soldiers home. So related to that, if mm -hmm. you're trying to end COVID with that, um, is uh, what are issues from your perspective on uh, vaccines um, and the use of vaccines. If you pass. are, in, if you, so my COVID policy is already posted. If you are a medical professional, vaccines are not an option. If you are a regular citizen who does not work in medicine, then you would follow the same vaccination uh, programs that we have always processed. If you are able to opt out for a religious reason, you would opt out. If you're able to opt out because of a health reason, you would opt out. But if you are a doctor or a healthcare professional, it is not an option because you will infect people. We already have cases of this happening. Awesome. AJ. Yeah, with um, your drug policy. Um, drug policy, the decriminalization policy or the universe? Yes, you're decriminalizing it. So you, you are looking at like models like what Portugal has done over 20 years ago. But are you also looking at like different cities like Vancouver that you have facilities like on-site where people can go and go to like safe injection sites and give them the option that is what you seek. Um, that's already recovery. included. That is included in my decriminalization policy. If you haven't read it, it's at jasminesherman.com. We are putting safe use centers in every zip code. We already have them for alcohol. We call them bars. But we want to make sure that people who want to get off of drugs have access to do that. We enrolled cannabis. It's no longer considered a drug as far as our administration would be concerned. Cannabis is medicine. We have people of all ages that need it and rely on it. So we would use cannabis as you know, within your universal health care. And that would also fund the reparations package that my platform has. But we do put safe use centers in every zip code. We make sure there is a medical facility in every zip code, including a dentist's office and an optometrist as well. We have to get back to mixed walkable neighborhoods. And we it's not enough to say, oh, we want to do that and then make no literal steps or plans on how that happens. Did that answer your question, AJ? It, it does. And, and I guess, you know, the, the quick follow up is so there's already like um, a mentality of funding, just like social service, like in general, you know, and the separate there's almost a separation between health care and social service so it would like with your administration how would you either reframe or change the narrative um in the united states to focus you know that we do need to think of um mental illness and things like substance use disorder and everything else that's part of healthcare, so people can understand it and we need to start either funding it, decriminalize, and, you know, take care of people's needs. What is your specific question? Because if you're asking me how I'm going to change the culture's narrative in four years, I can't do that. I have less than seven months to get elected. What I can do is stop talking to people that are wasting our time. The younger generations already know that mental health is a serious issue and they have no issue with funding it. When you're talking about people who have problems with stigma and funding it, you're talking about older people. And I'm not targeting them because statistics show that they're very comfortable. Now, the group that is here, I'm not talking about you clearly, but for the most part, older people are very comfortable with the way things are and they have proven to be bad voters. So we are tackling the population of Americans that do not vote. We are tackling people that are not comfortable and we've had much success thus far. But I'm not going to be able to make people get along. I'm not going to make bigots stop being bigots, but I am going to provide for people's basic human needs. And because that does include universal health care, which includes mental health treatment, I would suggest as many people who aren't going to be mandated to take therapy take upon themselves to work on that healing journey. But I can't make everyone do that. Kingfisher, I see you on the stack. 
Yes, thank you so much. I, I would like to tap your insight just to get your perspective on the, you know, the prison system. And, you know, in my mind, especially thinking of like Angola, Georgia, the prison system democratized slavery. We're a slave nation. Either we're dependent on foreign slavery or we hold the, the most prisoners of any nation. And um, how do we transition? I mean, I like the idea of a, pr a prison uh, to treatment approach, but how would you work between the prison apparatus and uh, successful rehabilitation treatment? So if you read my abolish police policy, I abolish prisons. We go to a system that uses more of a house arrest situation. It's kind of like when rich people kill or do something bad, we don't put them in jail. We put an ankle monitor on them, a guard outside the door, and we leave them with their dignity in their homes. We would be doing the same thing in a Sherman administration, except I know that these individuals will no longer be being abused or violated. They would already have mandated therapy, like I talked about in my last answer. Um, does that help you? Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think, I think prison that's should great. be abolished. I, I really agree with you. Thanks. Is there anybody else that has any other questions? Um, if not, I appreciate Josh for being the most supportive in this chat. Josh has nodded. Josh has hasn't said a word, but he's been engaged. I appreciate you, Josh. Um, but that's, I mean, I see you, Mr. Bobby. Do you have a question for me? Because you're on mute if you do. Hi. Yeah, it's not a question so much as um, to go back to your housing um, stand or position or platform. Um, one thing I've been working on really hard in this north central Wisconsin you know, small city area is the idea of uh, getting local government uh, and citizens together and putting enormous pressure on the state legislature uh, to use the state power, which is the power of taxation, uh, to free up a very large amount of funding that would go straight to um, cities and counties to build collaborative public housing uh, that would not be the old uh, <laughs> Not the old hood model, but uh, something more participative with, with uh, resident councils uh, and we're collaborating with the city councils. In other words, it, it, it's not a matter of the, the HUD boss uh, bossing around tenants like they do here in our low income housing. So that that's kind of what I think that your uh, concept of uh, housing is, is solid and I'd, I'd like to see us uh, spread that idea statewide for state implementation beyond federal implementation. So that's, that's all I had to say on that. I just wanted to clarify though, because we are giving the land back to the indigenous community, when it comes to policing how you live with inside your home, the government isn't going to be doing that. As long as you are not like harming people, whatever you do with your life and your property or where you are for the time being in the Sherman administration is what you do. And so what I'm saying is we're not building ghettos. I wouldn't be creating new infrastructure. There is already so much housing inventory here that all we have to do is use eminent domain and put people who don't have housing in housing. We take old malls and we convert those into condominiums for people with extreme allergies. And when I mean extreme allergies, there are people that can't be around latex. There are people that can't do certain type of water, right? So there are other ways that we can make sure everyone has a good quality of life. But I do feel like the whole concept of states' rights has really held us back because bigots have somehow gotten into power and they have been greedy and they have done things that are demonstrative to marginalized communities. So HUD and things like HUD, I would be looking to strip and or reform completely because it doesn't serve the people it's supposed to. Is there anybody else that has any other questions for me or? Any Kingfisher stack. Sure, go ahead. Um, you just mentioned eminent domain, and I just want to point out that Embridge, the pipeline company from Canada, threatened my neighbor. My neighbor 
a, what his kid was in college downstate talking bad about Embridge. Embridge called him up and threatened eminent domain on his property if his kid didn't stop talking bad about the company. So eminent domain is being used to threaten people currently. Yes, yeah. I plan to use it for public good. And that's how I'm going to defeat the lawsuits that are coming. Because as long as you give people that have paid for their home the money back that they spent and you do not remove them from the property, it qualifies as being worthy of eminent domain because I'm paying you, allowing you to remain, and it is for the public good. Our lawyers have told us that's the way. Are there any other questions? We have time for one more question for Jasmine, and then we'll be moving on to our next participant. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. Best to your success. That's what I'm doing, multiple political parties. I will be on all 50 states' ballots, including Alaska. Did you raise your hands, James, because you had a question or you were waving goodbye? Waving goodbye. Okay, thanks. Jasmine, thank you so much for sharing with us and taking your time to present to the Wisconsin Green Party. Are we waiting for? I just got a positive announcement for you guys. I think I'm getting the Afro Man debate uh, endorsement. So that'll be really good for the Green Party. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Hi, this is Jill. Hi, Jill. Hey, Jill. You are up whenever you are ready. We would okay, love to hear great. you speak. I am well, Sorry, can you say that again, please? We'd love to hear hear what you have to say and offer the floor to you. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so very much. And thank you for all you're doing in Wisconsin to keep leading the charge as you have done for so many years. And I would love to share with you a little bit about the campaign. I think probably people are generally familiar with what we're about, so I'll go light on our agenda. Uh, it's pretty much the green agenda that we've all shared for uh, for years, and uh, if there are any variations on that, I'll try to mention them. Uh, and I guess it's mostly the status of the campaign and what it's like out here on the campaign trail and uh, the ballot access um, fight that I'd love to just fill you in on and then hear any questions and thoughts and, you know, comments uh, on your end. So, you know, basically uh, we're in this historic moment as empire and oligarchy are teetering at the brink and we're facing pretty much existential crisis in virtually every dimension of our lives from crushing inequality, endless war, climate collapse, uh, an assault on our democracy, crisis of immigrant rights, uh, healthcare, education, student debt, you name it, in every direction, things are generally moving backwards and at an accelerating pace. Uh, the need for deep system change has never been so urgent, and the possibility of that change has never loomed so large, and that's really thanks to so many grassroots groups uh, and grassroots forces, including uh, the, our Green parties, which are really leading the charge, standing up and you know demanding everything from a Green New Deal to an end to endless wars, uh, uh, justice at the workplace, an end to student debt, you know, fighting pipelines, et cetera, um, and fighting genocide, of course. And so the terms in this race, this being you know our third for our group, um, that has helped support uh, my candidacies. Third time around, uh, let's see, I'm going through a tunnel here. I hope I won't get cut off. If I do, I will call you back in about five minutes. Um, you know, so it's different. And uh, it's really exciting to see so many people who've really hit the breaking point with uh, empire, oligarchy, and politics that represents them. 
So there are all sorts of new people who are showing up. I'm on the road right now in New York State uh, preparing to launch our petition drive uh, on Wednesday. And uh, we're doing a lot of events, and there's really great turnout. And it's a diverse turnout, more diverse than I've ever seen um, uh, politically. I mean, we've had racially, um, you know, class diversity, et cetera. We've had that before. But uh, political diversity we haven't seen so much of. And there are a lot of people coming in from the Democratic Party, uh, you know, for whom uh, genocide has just been the last straw. Let me just check and see if you are still hearing me because I'm deep in the tunnel. Are you able to hear me still? Yes, we can still hear you. You are. Okay. All right. Great. I wasn't sure if you were still there. All right. Very good. Um, you know, yeah. So we're seeing a a huge uh, surge of support, which is really exciting. We've been running, uh, let's see, the last national poll was 4%, and that was, you know, Quinnipiac, I think, which is a major polling firm. So this wasn't, you know, some kind of fringe poll. Percent among people age 35 and under, which is generally, you know, sort of an indication of which way the wind is blowing. So that's been great. Uh, really very focused right now on uh, on the outreach at the grassroots level and uh, getting on the ballot on all states. And at that point, um, it will be much harder for mainstream media not to cover that. But we're not spending too much time. Jill, you're um, cutting. Progressive. Oh. Yeah, let's see. Are you hearing me now? Yes. You are. Okay. Uh, we've reached the low point in the tunnel. We're now coming up. So hopefully uh, the audio will improve going forward. Just to say that 12% uh, under 35 being really great under age 35 is great, considering that we haven't had broad mainstream coverage. Uh, but we are building really fast, um, uh, particularly in, on TikTok and Instagram, where we haven't had accounts before. And that's been really exciting to see that growing exponentially. Uh, you know, and it's no surprise to see people uh, crossing over uh, given, you know, the record of the uh, parties of war on Wall Street uh, with 60 percent more than that living paycheck to paycheck, um, with half of renters struggling to keep a roof over their heads, financially stressed to meet their, meet their uh, rent on a monthly basis, homelessness at a record high, you know, student debt continues at uh, 44 million. Uh, child poverty doubling, uh, incredible despair and hopelessness among youth, uh, you know, the devastating numbers on um, this chronic illness and especially the opioid crisis. So there are just so many drivers now of the demand for more political choices. We are fighting that full on. The Democratic National Committee announced that they have hired an army of lawyers. We're familiar with that. You know what it's about in Wisconsin. Uh, we know what it's about from Matthew Ho, et cetera. So we're uh, prepared to be fighting that full on. Um, uh, you know, and, and once again, our agenda uh, has made waves. Our agenda, meaning the Green Party's agenda, launched initially uh, by Ralph Nader in the year 2000. And whether you're looking at Medicare for all, uh, abolishing student debt, free public higher education, um, a military budget that would be cut by at least 50% in order to put our resources <clears throat> into the true sources of security here at home. Um, uh, you know, on issue after issue, we have really charted the course for the progressive agenda. It's been adopted by progressive Democrats. Uh, though only in lip service, uh, not actually in action. Uh, but it makes clear, you know, that we as Greens have been ahead of the curve and we have a huge impact whether we are being elected into office, and many of us are at the um, local level, some 
150, 200, something like that, office holders currently, and well over 1,000 over the decade plus uh, of our, uh, you know, of our history. So we make a difference whether we're in office or even at, in the worst case, we're just fighting the battle. Uh, we, we change the course of history. And now, particularly, that people are tearing their hair out at the two genocidal pro-war parties, uh, it really is a perfect storm for what we as Greens have been working for, for most of our lives, I think most of us. And we are set now to be the only pro-worker, anti-war, anti-genocide, climate emergency campaign on the ballot across the country, truly contesting for power. Because as you know, if you're not on the ballot for you know at least 90 to 95% of voters, you really don't have a chance of being uh, taken seriously as a true contender. Our hope is to be on the ballot for all voters across the country. We are currently uh, on the ballot in something like 22 states, but there are a number turning in signatures over the course of the next one, two, three, and four weeks, and we expect those numbers to go up substantially. But even where we are right now, we have more than uh, 75% of the total signatures behind us. And that is thanks to the state parties who've been watchdogging this and maintaining their ballot access. This is why uh, being a grassroots, decentralized, uh, real political party uh, is just absolutely invaluable. And that's why we have substantial ballot access and why we can achieve the rest of it at far less cost than what it will cost, say, uh, you know, Cornell West or even RFK. Um, you know, RFK, of course, is a uh, uh, a super uh, fascist Zionist, so he's not in our league, but there are a couple of candidates who are, who share our agenda, that being Cornell West and also Claudia uh, de la Cruz. Uh, we have a very similar agenda uh, but what is different for us is that we have the party. We have, you know, a, an experienced party and a very, um, uh, uh, you know, strong party in terms of state representation. We are in most states to one degree or another, and and we've done this before. So uh, we are confident we do have to raise some money or get a bunch of volunteers out to New York to help us. This is the big... Uh, you know, this is the big uh, uh, fight back from the empire, really, to keep us off the ballot and to deny voters uh, their right to choose at a time when voters are uh, off the charts in demanding alternatives to the zombie political parties and their zombie candidates that are being uh, really rammed down so many people's throats right now. So uh, it is a perfect storm. Ballot access is going well. As I mentioned, we're about to launch in New York, and I just spoke to Texas, and Texas is going to send some volunteers, uh, a caravan of, of volunteers up here to help us. We will try to arrange homestays if people are able to spend a few days or a week or even a couple weeks uh, in New York. So I definitely want to pitch New York. This is the big obstruction. They want to keep us off so that we are not a true force to contend with. But uh, the battle lines have been drawn, and... We intend to blow them out of the water by uh, fighting our way onto the ballot. Uh, and we are fundraising and, um, you know, and uh, reaching out to volunteers, both in New York State, of course, and uh, across the country. And those are Greens, and they're people from other parties as well, uh, other progressive and socialist parties who really want to see uh, us have a ballot line. Us meaning us as the Green Party, but us as the you know anti-war, anti-genocide, uh, uh, climate emergency, pro-worker um, agenda. There are a lot of others who are going to be joining us in this battle, so it's very exciting, and we are really quite hopeful that this will happen. Um, um, Jill, are you open yeah. to accepting a few questions? Absolutely, and I think I have kind of gotten through with what I wanted to say, so thank you for hearing me out, and go right ahead. Michael. Uh, I would like to point out 
for everybody something that Jill said, which applies especially to Jill, but it also applies to the other candidates that we heard from. Um, I was the uh, person running the volunteers in Wisconsin during the great 2016 recount. And Jill raised, quote, correct me if I'm wrong in the numbers, Jill, but during her 2016 campaign, she raised about $3.5 million. Once we announced that there was an effort to do the recount, we had roughly seven million dollars coming in within two weeks. The point being, there is ample evidence out there of dissatisfaction with the current system, and when the message is there, people do come to the Green Party. Pass. Thank you, Michael. Yes, I couldn't agree more, and we're really feeling that big time right now. It's definitely the perfect storm. Other questions, comments? James. Hi, Dr. Stein. James Bankard here. I, I met you first at the Rage Against the War Machine rally last year oh, cool. in D.C. Oh, and I saw you at Madison in Milwaukee when you came around here. Just a follow-up mm -hmm. on the question I asked you. I asked you then, uh, would you talk to uh, Tucker Carlson? Would you talk to Glenn Greenwald? And you said, I think we should talk to everyone. So. I follow Glenn, Glenn Greenwald's show. It's called System Update. It's on Rumble. And he said on his Locals platform, an after show, like a couple of days ago, that he would like to have you on. He said it more of an aside, but I just think that's something to follow up on. And uh, he's been covering a lot of the civil liberties issues and the FISA yeah. uh, and, uh, legislation that was just um, that was just reapproved. So I think there's an opportunity there um, yeah. if you yeah. are interested in talking to him. Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh, that's really exciting to hear. Uh, that's great. And we will follow up. Yeah. And if you have suggestions about how to reach him, <laughs> if you had any thought, I know maybe it's getting on one of his local uh, conversations, but yeah, we'll definitely do that. He's I don't have a Twitter account. I don't have a Twitter account. My wife does. Maybe she can reach out or something like that. But uh, I, I know enough about Edward Snowden and Greenwald to distrust Twitter, oh, yeah. but I'll, I'll, I, I can give that a try. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. And you can just refer them, you know, to um, uh, press or myself, you know, at Goldstein2024.com. Rita. Great. Thank you. Okay, we have a question here. Oh, my mic's not on. We have a question here. Um, as a doctor, I'm, as a doctor, uh, we were wondering what you thought were um, good and bad policies in the COVID era, and also um, what do you think of all the the doctors that lost their licenses because they were advocating for early treatment? Okay. Yes. So I want to make an overarching comment here which is that it's very hard to trust our regulatory agencies, you know, uh, across the board, whether you're talking the FAA or the EPA or the uh, FDA or the CDC, that our regulatory agencies have really lost uh, confidence and trust of the American people because the whole system has been so corrupted by uh, powerful special interests, by both the money and the revolving door between industry and private profits and the regulatory agencies. So it is very hard for us to, you know, have a consensus and for people to have confidence in the rulings of our regulatory uh, agencies. And I myself as a doctor uh, actually reviewed at the very onset of the epidemic, I took about three weeks to read the data uh, because uh, having family members who were on the front lines of treating very, very sick people and, you know, with their faces in the faces, you know, of people in critical care, um, you know, dying from COVID. I really wanted to know what was the story with the vaccine. And <clears throat> I read enough to be very confident that the risks of dying from the disease were infinitely greater dying and disability from the disease were infinitely greater than the risks of the vaccine. Um, but let me say that was well over two years ago. 
And what I was especially convinced of at that point is that we need people who understand this data, uh, who don't have a conflict of interest, who are on it full time, and who are making that data and the evidence available to us as people, and who are making recommendations that we can trust. I am not a fan of mandates and never have been. Um, in Back in the day, uh, when people had more confidence in the medical establishment, mandates were not a thing. And uh, recommendations were strong enough that uh, there weren't issues about, um, you know, the risks of exposures. Uh, from people who were not vaccinated or do, who did not have immunity. Uh, this was not an issue, and there was greater confidence in this, just the body of scientific data. And where we are now is that we need people who are following the data. We need the research to be done by institutions that do not have a conflict of interest in the research. I myself am not actually following the data right now, and I feel like it needs to be data-driven, uh, driven by data together with our values as a society. There's no such thing as science in a vacuum. Science always exists uh, in, real, in the real world. And so I tend not to take a hard-line position right now. My position is that we need to get the conflicts of interest out. We need to have uh, data and um, uh, regulatory agencies that we can rely on to be reviewing this stuff and making the best science uh, available to us, whether it is uh, pharma science or whether it's uh, alternative science. We need to have it reviewed and available and then um, recommendations made on that behalf. <clears throat> there is one um, member of the, what is it? I, I guess it's the FDA vaccine board. Uh, who is more, what should we say, open than others and tends to issue um, opinions uh, that are far more, uh, what should we say, um, that depart from kind of the pharma approach. And, you know, we need to, ha we need to have an entire uh, regulatory apparatus that is not under the um, uh, under the thumb of big industry. So, you know, I myself get vaccinated uh, for COVID uh, most of the time, but I haven't been keeping up with all of the recommendations. I do not have complete confidence in, in all of the recommendations, and that's just where I am as a person and a medical doctor. If I had time to keep up, I would, but uh, ordinary mortals don't, and you kind of need an MD in order to read, the, truly read this stuff. Um, and we need people to read it with, uh, and, and I have to say, not being a, uh, a virologist or an immunologist, I'm not fully capable of reading this data either. So that's what we need. We need a body of scientists who are accountable to us, the people, and not to the industry. Um, Jill, the, um, and yeah. just, just in favor of, uh, in all yeah. fairness, we've offered all the candidates an equal amount of time and we're coming up towards the end. We've got two more questions Great. on stack for Great. you. If you can answer them real quick. Uh, first Great. Bobby okay. and then Kingfisher. Oh, yeah, let me unmute. Uh, hello, Dr. Stein, I'm uh, Bob Gifford. I recently rejoined the party. I had worked on your 2016 effort and uh, locally saw the, or informally uh, watched the recount go on. But um, on a, my question goes to um, finding out if you are, or how much outreach you are doing with the, uh, what I would call the new labor movement, because I myself, and uh, I came out of the old uh, radical left labor movement of the 70s and 80s, and, um, you know, I'm looking at, uh, I think you may have been in contact with Chris Smalls from the Amazon yeah. uh, organizing right. effort. And I, I just want to stress how important it is now. There, there really is a new uh, labor forming, and it, it, especially in Gen Zero and, and millennial workers, um, a lot more favorable to unions now. 
We just had a yeah. campaign at the Starbucks here in Plover, a little uh, right. city of, you know, like 10,000 people. And I was shocked, you know, that they won wow. and we went over and demonstrated with them. So I just, maybe a few words on how much more you can do to, to bring uh, the working class into the, into the campaign. Yeah, absolutely. And in particular, you know, labor itself. You know, I feel like our whole agenda is very much a working class agenda, you know, in demanding an economic bill of rights, basically, which is what uh, working class people need. You know, we need an economy that works for the working class. And right now we don't have that. That's really what our overarching agenda is about. But more particularly to the labor struggle, uh, especially labor outside of old labor, which is very hard to uh, woo away from the Democratic Party. Just yesterday, we were at the uh, strike of the uh, Gannett uh, workers uh, in uh, in Rochester, where the um, the local paper is on strike uh, because of the you know abuse of of workers on the job in the uh, old legacy newspaper industry, um, and. You know, the best reception that we've gotten, obviously, is is with the likes of Chris Small and, you know, the um, the railroad workers also, you know, the railroad workers union has also called for uh, political independence from the major parties. They who were oppressed by uh, the decision of Biden and Congress to deny their right to strike and which forced uh, a contract that they had already rejected that contributed to uh uh, dangers uh, at the workplace and ultimately to the uh, to the crash at uh, East Palestine. Um, so it's those sorts of unions who really are not part of traditional organized labor. And I will mention uh, one of the groups, which is it? It's uh, uh, not the United Auto Workers. It's the Teamsters. The Teamsters have not yet endorsed Biden. I will, you know, note that, which is. Uh, a possible opportunity. So we will be pursuing all of those opportunities. If you have connections to, um, you know, new labor, uh, the fights going on that are not part of uh, organized labor, those are especially, you know, fertile territory for us to explore. And that is a high priority for us. So thank you for that suggestion. I couldn't agree with you more. Uh, Kingfisher, quick question. Jill, please keep your answer quick as well. Just can you hear me? Okay. Yep. Yeah. People can hear me? Okay. Yeah. Jill, um, in a prior gathering, I asked you about the organic analogy, the comparison between uh, a biological living organism and society. Maybe we individual humans are biological living cells to the whole organism of society. Well, now um, all the candidates... Um, you're facing mass murdering fossil fuel addict druggies. So as Jill, you're a medical professional. Is there any comparison between like a, a, a generalized medical professional dealing with a violent druggie, a mass murdering violent druggie, uh, and being a politician now dealing with the, you know, socially legitimized mass murdering fossil fuel drug addicts past. If I understand, you're making the analogy between uh, the health threat of, say, you know, opioid addiction and addiction to fossil fuels. Is that what I understand you to be saying? In a way, it's addictive behavior because violence is instant gratification. Revving the gas pedal is instant gratification. You know, um, all that is instant gratification. So how do you pull the tools of a health professional and apply it to the tool bag of a politician? Exactly. And in many ways, I'll just summarize to say that I describe my, uh, you know, my my um, activist life as having been a um, uh, a medical, you know, having practiced cl clinical medicine. <clears throat> and then moving to political medicine. And I very much see that analogy. And this really is about the pursuit of a healthy society. Um, you know, uh, that is the bigger picture. 
We are pursuing health in our relationship to the planet, in our relationship to each other, uh, and uh, in our effort to overcome the, uh, the predatory, toxic threat of corporate rule, oligarchy, and empire. So, yes, I absolutely do perceive this in very organic terms of health and um, uh, illness and, and a dire threat to our very survival. Uh, that really is, to me, very much what, what the political struggle is about. So, yes, absolutely, I see the terms very much that you're describing this in. Dr. Stein, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you very much. Take care. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dr. Stein. First, if you still want stack, you're welcome to it. Just need to keep moving. Yeah. Would, would we like a five minute break before we move on to our um, Senate and congressional candidates? Give them time. Yes. Okay, we will take five minutes and then return at 2.23. To talk with Chester and Joe Nathan about their campaigns. Thank you.
Okay, everyone, we will be returning shortly. Um, when Chester is ready, Chester may take the floor. Um, we'll be hearing for Ch from Chester, who wants to be the Wisconsin Green Party uh, CD1 candidate, and then we'll be hearing from Joe Nathan, who is running for U.S. Senate. Following the meeting, we will put open out ballots via OPA vote to uh, cast our nominating votes. Who are you doing first? Who are you doing first? Um, we're we're going to give Chester the floor next if he's okay. open to it and ready. Chester, well, you're up. Yeah, we'll see. I'm going to go first. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, um, my name is Pete Karras. I'm Chester's campaign manager. Um, Chester will be up here in just a minute, but um, just wanted to tell you kind of where we're at is Chester and I were talking, I don't know, a few months ago about building a movement in, in, uh, in the area. And uh, we came up with the idea of Chester running for running for Congress and talked to some people and they were really excited about it. Um, we're, he's running for Congress. He will be our next congressman in the first district. There's no doubt about that. Um, but in addition, uh, we also have uh, Chester's mentoring someone. His name's, and unfortunately, he had to leave, but his name's uh, Xavier Golden. And Xavier is, will be 25 years old two years from now. He is going to soon be announcing that he will be running in 2026. So we should have continuation in the campaign from this, uh, from this election through the next and use this campaign as a core in southeastern, southern Wisconsin to, um, to build a movement. Um, if you haven't done so, please visit justertodd.org. Um, we have a website up. Um, there, we have a really cool feature on there. It's called the Donate button. So if you haven't seen one of those before, uh, click on it and see what happens. Um, but uh, we also have uh, recruited some uh, really great video, um, video creators, and they're on board with us. We're going to be doing a... Um, uh, um, this time on voting Green Party is kind of the slogan, and uh, there'll be some videos along with that, some signs. Um, we have a pretty, we have a pretty advanced campaign team, which is really cool, um, and we should be able to implement a lot of things that we're we're trying to do, um, assuming we can raise the money that we need to raise. But all that being said, um, I'd like to introduce Chester. He's going to tell you a little bit about, uh, I guess, about how his values are Green Party values. So, Chester Dodd. Thank you, thank you. Uh, coming to you from the second worst city in the nation for black residency, uh, right down the street from Milwaukee, which is the number one worst city for black residency. Probably the reason, and I probably knew this before they figured it out, probably why I threw my uh, ballot away for the Democrat in 1990 and uh, haven't voted for them since except for the Obama years. Tired of black people being bamboozled all over the place every two to four years. Democrats come in our community, collect the political capital on false premises principles and false promises, never return a receipt stamp paid in full. They talk about inclusion, but the only inclusion is reserved for those who get dust on their knees. I'm not one of those. And what really drew me to the Green Party Long before I knew the, the principles, the platform, the policies, the value, was Jill Stein. Well, and of course, Ralph Nader. Uh, but Jill uh, really impressed me. I, I like her ideologies. I like her approach towards humanity. 
And as I said, I had a chance to meet her, by the way, a couple of weeks ago, which was a highlight in my life. Um, but I, uh, I like, like I said, at our meeting, at, at our event, that I'm a human. That far surpasses any political pop party or anything else, just being a human. What's going on in Palestine now is one of the worst atrocities I've had to witness in my 82 years. How we can stand back not only as Americans, but citizens of the world, and watch 10,000 children get covered up with white blankets as they lay dead on the ground. And then I see this administration, see, this is why I left the party. It's all false. How in the hell do you drop food to people who are, are under a genocidal situation and you fatten them up for the kill so that when they go get the food, they get killed. It's crazy. It's crazy. And that is my tax dollars, and I try my best to wash the blood off my hands every night because it's my money killing people who look like me. But that's not really the big thing. It's just that it's genocidal behavior. It was brought to me by my young mentee. He says, not only that, Mr. Todd, Xavier, he says, not only that, if you kill 10,000 children in Palestine, and each one of them kids would do to have two kids, you now kill 20,000. So then we realize what they're trying to do is completely annihilate the Palestinians, you know? And, but they tell us, no, 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 we're not trying to do that. Other thing that kind of bothers me, and I don't want to make enemies, but if I could get into Congress, maybe I can find out why we're so dedicated to those people. And, 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 and I don't want to be anti-Semitic about it, but why are we so dedicated to that little bitty piece of land, you know? Why not the river to the sea? Why not? What's, what's the problem? Aren't they? Don't they have any humanistic people in, uh, that that believe in humanity in Israel? Now, here in Racine, southeastern sector of Wisconsin, we have exclusion of blacks economically. Corrupt criminal justice system. A governor that plays with race like it's a paradise. He knew, now Tony knew, I can call him Tony because I know him. I, and I've met him about five times. We sat down and talked. He knows the, the drier circumstance that blacks live in, in the southeastern sector of this state. Never done anything for us until just recently, last year, at the end of last year, because he knows of the big elections coming up, he appointed a black judge, female judge, to the bench, and I think a black male. Now, the black female lost. He could have made these appointments two years ago. You see, so the race game is being played. What, what I want to do with my candidacy is to draw in more minority and disenfranchised people of all races into this party. Mm -hmm. I think the time mm -hmm. is right, right now. we got blacks who are abandoning especially the young blacks are abandoning the uh, Democratic Party. Some of them are even going over to Trump. Heaven forbid, I wish they would come, come to us, you know. But my young man that uh, P. 
he was talking about, he has a lot of connections. He's going to reach out. We got, I got a young white gentleman who uh, just ran for alderman and lost. He's going to be included. He's about the same age. I think he's 25, but he's going to join the party. So uh, what we're trying to do down here is just to get more to, to, to widen, widen the spectrum of the Green Party. The average black person here, and I would dare say in the country, doesn't know anything about the Green Party. You know, they, they um, for some reason, I, and I don't know, but I'm going to change that. I will change that whether I'm elected or not. I will change that. That'll be my next, that's what I'll be working on. We've got to get, black people must realize that the Green Party is the alternative. It's also the solution. You know, in fact, the country needs to realize that. And I thank you. I need all the support I can get. Thank you. Dave. Thanks, Chester. Um, yeah, so I have a question for Chester and Pete. Um, I'm just wondering what are some of the uh, some of the things that you need donations for right now? Um, what are you spending money on or, or hope to spend money on? Do you have any specific targets for fundraising? Um, and what's your donation site? As I mentioned, Chester Tad, excuse me, ChesterTad.org. Okay, and it is in the in the chat. Um, but we have um, we're drafting a plan. Um, we know that uh, we have a, we have plan, we have, we're drafting plans that are if we raise you know twenty five thousand, which we think we can do. Um, not fairly easy, but I think we can do that. Fifty thousand and a hundred thousand if we can make this a really popular campaign around the country. And there's we have some marketing people working on that and trying to make some of those connections. Um, so we are doing that. Those plans include, um, well, immediately we have to get Chester on the ballot. So we need 2,000 signatures. Um, we are hoping not to have to pay people for um, very much money to gather signatures. Hopefully we can do it organically, but um, we also have expenses related to that. Um, and we may end up also having to pay some people. In fact, even pay some, we, we would like to pay some of the neighborhood people um, in, that are going to be going out and um, paying, you know, paying them a few dollars because they need a few dollars. So that that's that's an immediate need. Um, down the road, we have, um, you know, we're going to be doing, we're going to be highly targeting uh, the areas. We can't really cover the whole the whole um, district. So we have the cities of Racine, and of course, certain wards in the city of Racine. Same thing in Kenosha. Same thing in Beloit. Same thing in Janesville. Uh, we also have Whitewater. Uh, so we're going to be doing targeting. We are going. To, we would like to do signage. Um, that that'll make a very good statement. Um, online, um, we have online advertising. Um, our we have a fractional CMO that's working with the campaign, mm -hmm. and she's putting together um, kind of a budget for not only you know not only the Facebook ads and the you know Instagrams and that, but um, there's a way to do streaming commercials which is very inexpensive. And we do have people who, who are very, very capable of um, producing commercials. Um, I think that's one of the strengths of the campaign is going to be um, the, the videos we put out, the digital stuff. Um, I've seen some drafts of them, and they are just, they're, they're kick-ass, and they don't look like they're from 1990. Um, so they're kind of, it's really going to be great. You've got some great creators on board. Um, so I don't, Dave, did I... Did I hit all your questions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, basically, 
if you have you know uh, any particular uh, short term fundraising goal that you're trying to hit, you know that maybe folks here can help out with. Yes. Yeah, so we're saying by April fifteenth, which was the day for our nomination papers, which was next Monday, we'd like to raise two thousand uh, dollars. We do have somebody for the first thousand dollars that will uh, will double it. They'll match it. So that's kind of cool. So everything we raised between now and then up to a thousand dollars, and we probably raised five hundred of that um, is also matched by a donor who would like to be named later. So that would um, that be real helpful. Um, and I don't know if I mentioned it's a donate button on chesterpad.org. Can't mention that. <laughs> Any other questions for Chester or myself? Michael. I think has a question. Yeah, I, I do. Uh, it's partly a procedural question. Uh, I think we still have to hear from Joe Nathan's campaign, if I remember right. But uh, when that's done procedurally, uh, are we planning on voting on endorsing? And then are we putting on the table uh, for the uh, coordinating council uh, what we do institutionally? Because I think those should uh, be talked about. The other thing for uh, Chester's campaign or for Joan Nathan's uh, in point of fact also is uh, the resources of the um, the database of uh, Nation Builder. And also, um, this is me, let me put my video on. This is me talking from experience in my recent campaigns. <clears throat> you can get data from appropriate wards uh, or county clerks, which can be input into Nation Builder, which can then in turn guide walking doors, knocking on doors. That's how the big boys do it. Um, the issue is that if we put data into Nation Builder, we pay more for Nation Builder. And so those kinds of details need to be talked out um, and discussed and voted on and then coordinated with whichever campaign um, we wind up uh, working with. Um, to my knowledge, this is the first time we will have worked, if we do what I think we're going to do, this is the first time we'll work to this degree um, uh, to effectively work with a campaign. And with that, I will... Um, uh, pass. Yes, uh, Rita is correct. I was using Voter Action Network and not Nation Builder, but in point of fact, the software is similar under the hood. They are not identical, and I recognize that, but the capability is there. Pass. Bobby. Yeah, hi. Um, yeah, I appreciated what <clears throat> what you had to say, Chester, with regard to uh, continuing your work um, post campaign uh, in terms of organizing in, in those uh, three count well the counties that you have in that first district, and I I had got through this recent uh, county board election cycle. And I was just uh, amazed, I have to say, by the um, the Portage County Democratic Party running this huge uh, campaign machine out of their uh, headquarters, uh, endorsing and, and canvassing for people who were, you know, county boards are, are supposed to be nonpartisan, but because the Republican Party came out so strong in this, uh, it ended up being a two-party battle. And I had uh, people canvassing in uh, my village that were, you know, strong men and campaigning for me. So what I hope to see, um, and I, I think you could probably be the one to do it, would be to kind of get down and, and into the citizen action type organizations, the activists are working on even the most minute little city or county issues local issues on environment or housing or whatever you've got and really develop that kind of activity you know into uh 
Green Party strength because um, as I'm coming back into the Green Party, I see we don't really have um, what I would call very uh, strong local, uh, I would just use the word machines uh, the, to run in campaigns. And, and that's something that has to go on like every week, every month, constantly, all the time. You have to be building and building and building. So I just um, glad to hear what you had to say and hopefully you can get it done. Thank you. Thanks, Bobby. Thank you so much, Chester and Pete, for sharing your campaign. And we are excited about the work you are doing. Thank you. Joe Nathan is up next. He's asked that I share a video. Um, I think he's trying to limit how much he's speaking today because he had a recent surgery. Um, so I am going to start that screen share and video. I love that. ZB Kingfisher. I'm running for U.S. Senate. I hope you'll endorse me. I hope you'll vote for me. I hope you'll gather signatures for me. I hope you'll help me form a green government. Because we've got some problems and we already have the solutions. We need the human will to Look at the situation realistically. We have 10% of known species already gone extinct in the time of machines. That's an exponential curve, it's getting worse. It's worse than scientists thought at first. About half of all estimated species are gone. We're facing a 95% extinction rate in decades, in decades. This decade, we're experiencing the rising exponential curve of the great dying our, of our time. All we have to do is stop doing fossil fuels. Half of everybody that drives has to stop driving. You have to grow food and you have to grow soil. You put carbon into the earth like we know how to do stop polluting stop habitat destruction about 80 percent of wildlife populations are gone we have 20 percent of what's remaining and if that 20 percent is allowed to grow back we may have our earth our world for humans and earthlings and we're going interstellar. The humans are aliens now. The rich are Martians. Human earthlings, nature and society, healthy, not out of control growth like cancer, sustainable humanity, social environmental justice. Who's more insane? The chump 
that denies climate change and says he'll drill, 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 and fossil fuel will guzzle more. Or doing the Biden of the rich and powerful, acknowledging the climate crisis, fossil fuel crisis. John Kerry there saying we have nine years at the beginning of the Biden administration. And they rev the industrial engine harder. <laughs> Who's more insane? The one that says it's not real in the face of all the evidence year after month after month of record setting extreme climate crisis catastrophe collapse or the Biden dynamics <laughs> doing the Biden doing the bidding of the rich and powerful and acknowledging the problem saying yes we have to stop and we're not gonna stop they're revving the industrial engine to the bottom of the abyss we must stop fossil fuels we must stop habitat destruction if we don't stop consequences and situation will end us and we will stop please vote for me United States Senate. That's my commercial. Jonathan, are you open to taking questions as well? I'm off pain meds and talking pretty well today, so I, I think I can. Rita Stack. Rita, go ahead. I just want to know how many signatures uh, he needs to get on the ballot and if he's got his petitions on his website. I um, don't have a website. Um, I'm uh, uh, currently taking uh, any help I can get. So that I, I'm not even endorsed at this point. So um, that's, this is the process. So this was uh, step one. Is that Hannah? Well, Annie. I certainly, oh, yeah, I cer certainly appreciate the cute baby time. I'm thinking that's Hannah over there. Rita Stack again. Uh, are you planning to have uh, a website through Nation Builder or um, someplace where we could get resources um, that we could use? Because, uh, like, if we're gathering signatures for Chester, you're statewide, so we can also be carrying your clipboards. If the Wisconsin Green Party endorses me, I will put together a website, yes, and I will email it out. Any other questions? Otherwise, we'll wrap up the candidate portion. I have one, Zach. Chester. Joe Nathan, how are you doing, my friend? Really good, Chester. Good to see you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, uh, when you get endorsed, would you make a priority or one of the priorities in your campaign to look into the plight of indigenous women disappearing and getting raped and killed on the reservations when the pipelines are being uh, worked on. Could you do that? Oh, sure, Chester. And I'll tell you, um, it, it, the, the rape culture, the rape 
culture of the Republicans and Democrats is realized in the man camps of the fossil fuel addicts, the druggy junkies. And I'll tell you personally, I can I have trouble going down to the local grocery store without these man camp uh, inbridge pipeline workers. Like I carry my babies in the grocery store. They laugh at me and they swear at me. They swear at me when I'm carrying my babies in the grocery store. And I have to spit at grown men to enter into the grocery store. And I and they're raping our women. They are, you know, it's just ridiculous the degree to which uh, rape culture in the Republicans and Democrats is prevalent in our society across the way. So, yeah, I, I live it. Thank you. Pete Staff. Go ahead. Um, I just want to mention Joe Nathan and I were talking, and um, we've already put together, we were hoping he'd run, um, and we put together signs for southeastern Wisconsin that say, this time I'm, growing, I'm voting Green Party, and then underneath it will be Jill Stein president, uh, Joe Nathan, Senate, Chester Todd um, for Congress. So we're going to be running kind of a, we're going to be running together, at least in this congressional district. Thank you. Pastor. Thank you. I've seen those. Uh, I really approve. I approve those messages. That's great. I really appreciate. Go get them, Joe Nathan. Mr. Nathan. Hello, Jorge. Yes, sir. I'd like to um, I'd like to endorse you myself. I really like your 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 presence, your honesty from heart, and the realistic movement that you're trying to do. I, I um that's what the people really need. And so, but I'm also a trumpet player, and I you had the guts to go ahead and play that. And that that's another beautiful part. And in doing that, I want to con con conglomerate you because I'm also a trumpet player. I'm going to play the, the last part up the octave in, in uh, remembrance of you to vote for you. So here I go. <laughs> but anyway, that was for you in spirit. Sorry about the crap before, but oh, thank, thank you, you so much, man. Appreciate yeah. it. Thank you, Joe Nathan, and thank you to all of our candidates who have spoken today. Um, following this meeting, we will be sending out um, electronic ballots on all of those issues that have been talked about so that we can determine who we are endorsing and nominating going forward um, and can inform our representatives to the Green Party National that way. Uh, Joe Nathan, go ahead. I would just like to um, end on, on this one thought that you know, I 25 years ago, I was studying climate change, uh, earth system science at Michigan State University. And it's been a couple decades of watching the computer model predictions come about. And um, one of the things is over this time, oh, you know, over 30 years of, of uh, academic university education regarding climate change, is a lot of scientists, I've heard a lot of climate scientists say, I wish I would have spoken out more for what I knew. And that did not fall on deaf ears of mine. I, I hear that message and I am moved. My son asks me, you know, why do people pollute? 
I, you know, and I say, I wish I could make them stop. You know, I, I, I take to heart that this is something that we have known about. Um, Al Gore tried to address it. It was a judicial supreme corruption coup that stopped. Uh, ironically, the corruption out of Florida is turning that place into an island. Florida is going to an island if they're lucky. They're going underwater. And it's just like we need to wake up to reality and face it at an you know individual family, local community, tribal, state, nation, global level. So, yes, we are, have to look at reality and just like take stock of where we're at collectively and individually. Thank you very much. Rita Stack. Go ahead, Rita. Um, I wanted to make an announcement before the close of the meeting. Yeah, we have that not yet. We'll we'll take this time now for any announcements. Okay. I'm gonna post in the chat. Um, there the bylaws were changed in November. And uh, after discussions at the Greater Milwaukee Green Party meeting, uh, we drove some suggestions that would clarify what rules follow, that the state party follows, and what rules that the locals need to follow. And also, um, we were concerned that consensus building was taken completely out of the bylaws, and it is part of the National Green Party's um, meeting process guidelines. Uh, plus, I did a, a survey of several state parties, all of our surrounding state parties, Michigan, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, um, Missouri, Iowa, and California, Hawaii, uh, a bunch around the country, and they all have consensus in their bylaws. So I think we need to return those. So anyway, I'm, I'm gonna put that in the chat and hopefully at our next meeting, we can um, put that on the agenda. Over. Rita, just, just for some context, we just we have a bylaw that states that those have to be in 20 days before so we can give proper notice to everyone, which is the reason it was not on the agenda today. Um, we will make sure to get that on the agenda for the next meeting. Thank you. Um, Michael, I have a, a question and an announcement. I'll do the announcement first. Uh, as most of the, everybody, the coordinating council knows, and a lot of the other members know, I ran in a recent election. I was defeated two to one. Um, but what was striking about it was the barrage of emails and text messages that came out during the last week, uh, including creating a false web page, um, recreating a version by somebody else of the web page I had up when I was running for uh, governor, um, and a lot of false al allegations. The stuff against me was uh, relatively trivial, except it was the tone was terrible. But something else happened. All of these came out the week of the 24th through the 30th of March, right before the election. Also that week, somebody took my identity um, and sent an email to my employer asking that my paychecks be sent to a different bank. We are now dealing with the FBI um, as well as banking authorities, et cetera, um, but, you know, talk about directed attacks, the Republican Party, I, I, everybody bashes both parties, I understand that, but the Republican Party spent $50,000 on a county election, one circuit court judge and all the rest were county supervisors, and the barrage of um, negative attacks, um, uh, defamatory comments um, and false uh, outright statements, lies 
was was really striking. Um, the reason I'm bringing that out is for our candidates, make sure, absolutely sure, you have good electronic security and the your IT people are uh, being very careful because the bad boys are playing rough and they are really being bad. My being hacked and trying to steal thousands of dollars of my money uh, might be coincidental, but I don't think so. The question that I have is, okay, we're going to at some point vote on um, who we endorse, et cetera. Just point of information, all of the candidates that spoke to us meet uh, Green Party values. Uh, in the case of the Congress and the Senate election, we have one candidate for each that has approached us. Is there any reason that we would endorse only one or can we endorse in fact all three candidates as being worthy of consideration. So that is a, a question for the group and I pass. Uh, I, I have a related question because that will partially answer uh, Michael's question. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, my understanding is that we are, uh, uh, that, that we will have, we will have a vote uh, among the three can the, the three candidates will be on the ballot uh, as a res uh, depending on the results of those ballots delegates will be selected who so who uh, who will be representing those candidates that's uh, that's the part I remember from uh, from from past uh, past years. My question is how how are we proposing to elect uh, committed delegates? Who who will go to the to the presidential nominating convention? Do we know? Dave has his hand up. I hope. Yeah, I was just typing in the chat, but it'll be quicker to do a direct response to this. Um, yeah, so after uh, this gathering, all dues paying members in good standing will be sent electronic ballots to their email uh, via OPA vote, <clears throat> which is the software that we use. Uh, in the case of the presidential election, we will have a um, a well, we use uh, a proportional form of ranked choice voting. Um, and so we have four delegates in Wisconsin. Um, therefore, the threshold to win one delegate is 20%, um, which is where the you know ranking reallocation can come into play. Uh, but in short, our delegates will be allocated proportionally based on the results of the membership vote. Um, and our past practice has then been to find um, members of the CC to agree to, uh, you know, who are planning to attend the national meeting uh, to agree to fulfill those responsibilities, uh, essentially as pledged delegates to carry out the will of the membership. Um, so that at least is our past practice. Pass. Thanks, Dave. Bobby's on stack next, followed by Rita's crew again. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Just I want to just want to say in closing some things that um, going to sound like I'm just regenerating what I already said, but um, I think it's critical, and I would especially. Um, encourage people running at this uh, in Wisconsin elections to really, um, and I'm sure most of you are doing this already, but just dig down at the local, local level, hyper local level, and find people who are, um, you know, moving the needle on the issues like here in, here in Stevens Point, um, we had two women that ran for the county board both known activists on the clean groundwater issue 
uh, both highly credentialed in that field from the UWSP. And we had uh, uh, someone who pushed the county chair out. He's a big uh, urban sprawl, growthy type guy. So we, we had kind of a major um, shift in in the politics here. And I think this could be done. You got you just get involved in these issues and, and it could be the most seemingly micro thing in your community. Get involved, get to know the people. If you think they're fiery, encourage them to run for something, city council or county board or state assembly or whatever they can, can take on. And, and, uh, and that way, and, and keep this in their minds associated with you being green, you know, so that they don't have this disconnect between uh, the two parties and us. So that's all I'm saying is uh, just get down in the trenches and do it. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Rita or others. Okay, we have uh, actually a couple of questions here, but I also want to point out that uh, about the bylaws thing, we did not get the agenda until yesterday, and that's supposed to be published according to our bylaws 20 days in advance, too. So I'm just hoping that people will review these so that we can uh, vote on them at the next meeting. And I will put it in the chat as soon as I can get the link to it. Uh, we have Barb Eisenberg. You had a question? Um, yeah, you you attempted to explain the endorsement process, but it really wasn't clear to me. I wonder if you could um, summarize it one more time. I, uh, people that are in good standing in in the Wisconsin Green Party will be sent a ballot. But is that is that what we should be looking for? Yes. Um, I can respond to that. Yes, oh, or Emerson. Be... Yeah, sure. And how do we do rank choice if there's only one person? Thank you. Uh, so yes, everyone will be receiving electronic ballots, um, and I believe it's only residents of CD one that will be receiving them for Chester's, um, because. The rest of us are not represented by Chester. Um, I, I could be wrong about that. And someone else could say the rest of us should receive ballots for that as well. Um, the ranked choice is only relevant to the presidential race. Otherwise, it's an approval vote of as long as 60% of members or 60% of voting members say, yes, we should endorse. Um, we'll endorse. Okay, Thank you. That's much more clear. Hi. Um, it's, many of you might know that I'm an elected official to the Wisconsin Conservation Congress. And this last week was the major time to put in input for the spring hearing. The convention is also a public affair, and that's next month on. May 10th and 11th, and it's going to be held in Appleton. That means that I'm going to be up there. I've already um, talked to Rita about going up there as well. So there's going to be some Milwaukee Greens there if any other Greens want to organize. And also you can attend the convention and see what uh, what's going on over there. I don't have the name of the hotel yet, but um, but it's uh, it's in Appleton. I think it's in the Hilton. But yeah, Appleton, May 10th and 11th. Thanks. Thank you. Anybody else from this group of announcements? Go for it. We have Bruce also. Yep. I have a question. Um, why would the state party not endorse congressional candidate. I mean, this is a state party endorsement, so why only the people in the first district? Uh, to me, that 
means the state party is really not endorsing just me. I'd rather see everybody endorse. I, I could have spoken hastily on that section. I'm sorry on that. I'm not certain what that policy is off the top of my head. If there's something stated in the bylaws that specifies that, that's what we have to follow. Otherwise, it'll be open to the whole state. Stack. Go ahead, Michael. So I was going to clarify what Bruce is bringing up is I would I would advocate unless there's something in the bylaws that we would as a state party endorse a congressional candidate in any district where we had one running. But what I really have is a, a procedural question. Once we vote and we have endorsed, if uh, the party as a whole then decides to provide additional support, administrative support or monetary support, does that require still another vote at another um, uh, meeting of the coordinating council? Um, or in fact, does that follow automatically? What's the procedure there? Because I think that's unclear. Um, I think that the party, Wisconsin Green Party has the opportunity to materially help, no offense, Jorge, but it's going to be less significant for you than it is a percentage of total votes for our, our two candidates that are in state. But we have the ability to provide some material administrative support, um, database support, et cetera, uh, and money, either as a whole party and, of course, as individuals. What do we have to do to do that? What's the procedure? And my, I hope my question is clear. Pass. Uh, your question is clear. It's taking a second to find where that was stated. Um, sorry. Um, upon the instruction of the membership, we to endorse candidates. Um, the financial committee of the Green Party is responsible for supervising disbursements of funds. Um, the courting council is required to approve all individual expenditures over 250 um, in advance. However, the financial committee is not does not have any specific requirement to have it voted on. There as long as it's within line of budget, say so. Currently, does not appear to have. So, but it doesn't appear to answer one of my questions, which is, for example, uh, email blasts from the party to members on behalf of any one of the candidates. Does that require approval? Is that automatic? Is that the decision of our co-chairs. Uh, I submit it's probably not clear in the bylaws um, just because we haven't been organized enough to do it in the past. So no disrespect to anybody. Um, I think that we should, however, address it at the level of the coordinating council either today or, or next week as soon as possible because the clock is ticking. Um, if, in fact, we're going to help our candidates, we have to start moving quickly and we should have policies moving forward uh, so that we are in a we are able to do some of those kinds of things getting ready for the next election i can tell you that uh, members of the various progressive elements including and not exclusively excluded not limited to uh, local democratic candidates but local progressive products candidates are not only looking towards november they're already looking and getting organized for next April. And we historically have been behind the power curve starting late. So I suggest that we pay attention to these details moving forward and I pass. OK. 
can I get on stack? Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, just to try to give a short response to Michael's points. I mean, these are certainly important points. Um, a lot of these are things for the CC and committees to work out, uh, particularly elections committee, but not limited to. Um, and, you know, as was pointed out with uh, the question of the congressional election endorsement, we don't have written procedures on all these questions. Um, it would be great to work those out, but, um, but yeah, uh, there, there's a lot of work to do. Um, I don't think we're going to figure it all out now, nor is it necessarily the appropriate place to do so. Um, since we're now in the discussion section of the gathering, but, you know, again, I encourage folks to volunteer for committees to be part of this work to volunteer for campaigns and help campaigns directly uh, with their needs, particularly ballot access. Um, and yeah, um, you know, en encourage all current officers, CC members, committee members, as well as anyone who is interested in, uh, in helping with these things to please stay engaged with this process uh, you know, we're not just voting, we're really launching these campaigns to the next level. Um, and with that, I'll pass. Looks like Bruce might be at the microphone. My question, no, I found the answer to my question. It's Article 9, Section 2, it says candidates for public office may be endorsed by decision of the Wisconsin Green Party if the candidate has publicly stated the acceptance of our key values and such. So, so it sounds like the, you know, black law, I mean, uh, bylaws, the state can endorse anybody from any particular uh, industrial or assembly, whatever district, as a whole. It doesn't have to go up. Simply to those people in the district. Bruce, I, I think we will act in that way as well and send it out to everyone. Thank you for that input. And I think we hear you in that regard. And I haven't heard any one speak against that. Does anyone have? Does anyone oppose that interpretation of the bylaws? I'd like to go ahead and announce, if I may, um, I really like you guys working together, and I appreciate that. I want to announce if I'm not endorsed, it's fine. I just want to show the greater good to to the to the Green Party is that um, to help these people get to work, and I created the Amplify Accessibility Green Tech Coalition, uh, empowering the disabled and blind to work. And so, if someone can help support this on my website, it's it's for the whole. Either I'm endorsed or not. I just want to let you know that my promise and my heart is to help get people, the economy back into a functioning society. Thank you, Jorge. Or hey, regard regardless of our decisions relating to now our, our votes on nomination, we look forward to working closely with you in the future to build a stronger nation, a stronger world. Thank you. It seems like...
conversation might be wrapping up, coming to an end. Would we like to close the meeting? Um, Kingfisher Stack. Go ahead, Kingfisher. Um, I just wanted to um, say a precautionary word. Um, I think we're all under attack. I mean, I really feel like the captains of industry and the leaders of our society are really holding us hostage. And I think our danger is very real. And so, I mean, I hear, you know, Michael's talk about his harassment and it's ongoing for me. I get threatened all the time. My family and children get threatened by just going out into society. So that's not new to me. Um, I, I am a little bit wondering like at wounded knee one of the only people killed was a u.s service veteran they shot him in the heart because i guess he was a traitor to them and i mean i wonder if michael gets extra treatment because of your service i don't know if there's some kind of uh ownership at play however i mean i i'm doing this because there's danger and we need a livable world there's danger if we don't do anything. I mean, I'm a survivalist and I'm a prepper and I, I like to take care of mine. However, we are all in this together. And if if the world collapses, if we all suffocate because the oceans are rotting, you know, there's no winners. There's no winners at all. So we're all in danger and we're all taking risks. And I'm just stepping up because you know it's you know a good time to and nobody else is so i mean people are but you know we all are doing this work we are all facing these risks so um great work everybody and chin up and you know stay strong and uh good backbone about it we'll do great in answer my attack uh, is trivial compared to a lot of others um but yeah i the way I look at it, I lost two to one in a very red district, but I like what one of my colleagues said. Look, Michael, you made them waste a lot of energy on you that they could have been throwing at something else. And so um, it's just every voice of protest, every voice of honor, every voice of doing the right thing is going to attract uh, opposition. But um, you can either be a bystander and complicit by doing nothing or stand up. And I prefer to be an upstander. Thank you, everyone. Pete Stack. Hey, Pete, go ahead. Hey, um, on behalf of everybody here at the uh, the Taste of Soul in Racine, was beautiful downtown Racine, Wisconsin. Um, we we took a kind of a, a a vote here, and it came out unanimous that we move to adjourn. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you for your motion to adjourn and all of your seconds. <laughs> Have a good evening. Thank you. And afternoon. Enjoy the sun. Thanks, everyone. Have a great one. Bye, everybody. Thanks.